Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the regular meeting of the Mahone Bay Town Council. This is the second meeting and the first really full agenda meeting of the new, uh, the new Town Council in Mahone Bay. Uh, welcome council members and staff and <clears throat> welcome to the people at home who may have taken the opportunity to tune in on YouTube to watch tonight's events. And there will be an opportunity at the end of the council meeting for you at home, if you have questions uh, to, uh, they'll be asked to council. And you're welcome to ask a question about anything that is discussed this evening by council. With that said, uh, I would offer that we are gathered today in the traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq, and we are grateful to them, the Mi'kmaq, Mi'kmaq people, for, for this opportunity. You have an agenda, Council, that was emailed to you. What is your wish? <clears throat> Mayor, I'd move that we approve the agenda as presented. Do we have a seconder? Seconder. Councillor Burdick, all in favor? Motions carried, thank you. Item number two, one on the meeting are the regular minutes of the November 10th meeting of town council. What would you like to do? I move they be accepted as circulated. Councillor Carver moves, do we have a seconder? Second. Deputy Mayor, I'm sorry, I almost said Deputy Mayor now. Francis is, is right there. Councillor Now, thank you. Moved and seconded that we uh, accept the minutes of the regular meeting of November 10th as presented. All in favor? Motion's <clears throat> carried. Let's go to our correspondence file. And we had, do have a couple of action items tonight. Uh, mm. The clerk, CAO, is one of you going to speak to item 4.1? That's the letter from. Um, Mr. Francis on the storage container. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, so as council knows through, oh. Uh, I'm sorry, Deputy Mayor has a. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm yet to fully get up to speed on, uh, I guess the process, but I would like to declare a conflict of interest on that issue. Okay, thank you. If, <clears throat> well, if do, we do you want me to? In, if we were meeting in person, you would leave the council table. Uh, yes. Deputy Mayor, we'll make note of that. But you have declared a conflict, and the time of you removing yourself from the discussion is uh, 7 05. Mm -hmm. Sorry, CAO, back to you. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Uh, so I'm just going to share the screen here with the request. Um, so as uh, some members of council for sure are aware. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, we want to make it bigger. Can you expand it? Yes. Yeah. For those I was of just our uh, part of vision. I was picking up the sign language. That's a good uh, signal yeah. we can use there. Thank yeah. you. Um, so yeah, as, as I think councillors would be aware, um, obviously during the pandemic, we've had some um, businesses that are trying to make do. Um, with uh, all of the provincial directives that are in place and still be able to operate their business. Uh, mostly that's been uh, restaurants that have been inquiring about their patio areas, like that type of thing. Council has uh, previously received one formal request um, from the um, brewery to expand their patio area. And um, essentially the way that that request was approached, and I'm just providing this for context here um, because it is similar, is that uh, the Council was advised that the land use bylaw would not permit the request and the town determined not to enforce that provision of the land use bylaw until the provincial um, state of emergency and directive uh, from the provincial officer of health were suspended. So essentially, mm -hmm. as long as COVID precautions are in place, the brewery has, um, is it, we're not going to enforce that specific provision um, that, that they needed out of the way in order to expand their patio area. So this request from the independent store uh, is put in those terms and council can, can certainly decide on 
Um, but it is in the same terms. During COVID, they are using a storage container which would normally not be permitted under the land use bylaw and requesting that during COVID they be allowed to continue to do so, uh, understanding that that would be a stay of enforcement under the land use bylaw and not actual permission to have the container. Okay. Councillor Feeney. <clears throat> uh, uh, Mayor, I guess my, my thinking about this is that it's my understanding that the, that the container has been in place far before, long before COVID pandemic arrived. It's my understanding it showed up somewhere in September of 2019 uh, in a timeline around when we were in hurricane season. So fair enough, I absolutely give, um, give Mr. Francis the benefit of the doubt as far as his business's requirement for it. Um, but I do believe that we should give very specific dates um, and not tie it to, you know, a nebulous date of time, the, which could be several years. So I'm thinking months, not years, uh, weeks, you know, weeks, months. Um, a, a, I think in a reason, a reasonable uh, accommodation can be had. Um, but I'm thinking, like, let's call this, you know, June 1st, 2021. Um, but at some point, the container needs to go, and I think we should be very forceful in delivering that clear, uh, succinct message. I think over the there's been a number of examples recently where we've been a little more reticent to ensure that bylaws are enforced vigorously, and I think it hasn't done us a lot of favors. So in this case, I think we should, you know, we should be reasonable, and I think it's a reasonable request. But I think we should be we should have a very definitive timeline on when the container must must be, be removed. And it's not clear to me why a, a movable can't, container can't be moved tomorrow, but obviously I think we're, we can find a middle ground here. Mm. Any other comments? Councillor Carver? Well, give, given that the reason for the container being there, uh, according to the letter, is to provide storage space for COVID related, related adjustments of shelving inside the store. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure that giving a hard uh, time limit fits that situation. Um, I, I, if, if we want to go in that direction of accommodation, I, I would use the timeline of the end of the declaration of the emergency plus Mm -hmm. five days or five business days or something like that. Mm. I also wonder whether the container could be moved from its current position right in the middle of the harbor view uh, into a more discreet position, but that's a... Interesting point. Councillor Burdick? Yeah, I, I do understand why the, the uh, storage container is there, at least in terms of keeping those fixtures in place. Maybe we can have a, a combination of those two ideas where it's reassessed in June uh, and maybe an in and, uh, being encouraged to find an alternate place for it in the meantime but not, a, not an absolute hard deadline to have it removed by that time. Mm. What, uh, Councillor now? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, giving them a timeline for it. Uh, but I also think that if we do set June 1st, maybe at our last meeting in May, we should discuss it further and see if it's warranted to extend it. But also in the meantime, I think we have to look at the whole business with the containers in town. Uh, I've noticed that there's several more in town now. Uh, in particular, I noticed just within the last couple of days, one on Foxburg Road. So I think we should be uh, you know, doing a survey of what's in town for containers and uh, as to why they're there and uh, decide whether we're going to start enforcing this bylaw or not, because uh, it seems to be getting more of it. And if we're gonna have the bylaw, we have to enforce it. Mm, he's awful. CAO? Uh, we've been following up on all of the leads, so if anyone has any new containers they'd like to report, just, just send it to staff. Um, we'll continue to do so. I do want to note that in at least one case recently, we did find out that a uh, moving company, uh, in order to comply with COVID protocols, was 
making use of containers. Um, mm. uh, there's a requirement to store materials for a period of time, I guess. People mm. can't unpack their stuff. So um, without going into the details, we may see that there are some more containers coming in temporarily in, yeah. in scenarios where people are moving. Um, but we'll make sure we chase down every one of these leads. Al has been yeah. in contact with folks. And so Richard, if you have some areas, just let us know. Thank you. Councillor Feeney. <clears throat> well, I think, you know, I think the town, I think the bylaw is quite reasonable. And I think the town's uh, enforcement of it has been reasonable. And I think we all understand the difference between a temporary storage unit used by someone who is in the process of moving or in the process of doing a short term home renovation. I mean, you know, they're going to show up, they're going to stay in someone's front lawn or back lawn for 60, you know, 90 days, maybe. But this container has been in place for, you know, 14, 15 months and it has to be removed so that we are able to have respectful conversations with everybody else that lives in down. So, you know, these are unique times. And I think, you know, there is an opportunity for, for the, to find a middle ground, but um, I think the message should be pretty clear that there is a town bylaw we expect it to be enforced. And, um, and let's just find in a reasonable accommodation. Now, you know, I, I have every confidence that the CAO and, and the deputy and the clerk um, can, um, can figure figure that out. I'm sure they're they're having direct conversations with the uh, with Mr. Francis. So I I just I'm hoping that next July we're not still staring at that white container in the middle of town. Now they'll paint it blue. <laughs> Fair enough. So no, as far I, as direction goes, we do um, in the current time with this request in front of us is the only thing stopping us from taking enforcement action. So. As with the brewery, a council would have to pass the motion, either setting it to go until the end of the state of emergency and, and um, medical order or until a date um, such as has been suggested. Otherwise, we will take enforcement action now. We just were mm -hmm. waiting because it was indicated that this request was coming to council um, recently. I, I, it would seem we have two cases here. One is in the case of the store where the reason why they've got the container is due to COVID, I agree it, with Councillor Carver, it should somehow be linked uh, to, the, to the emergency health order. But if it's not a container that's there for the purposes of managing your life around COVID, then we could have a specific timeline possibly built into the bylaw. The bylaw now doesn't specify at all, clerk, how long the container can be there, just that it can't be there. There is a provision, there are provisions under which a temporary storage container can be used, uh, generally tied to a building permit being issued. Hmm. Um, there is nothing in this case that would come into effect. Um, and as the CAO noted, the, um, the specific request had to do with uh, COVID provisions for the office. Mm. Uh, sorry, for the store. For the store. But uh, if, if I can also just add with respect to the bylaw enforcement, like the timelines for enforcement on things, obviously the council uh, members are aware that we've been stepping up our bylaw capacity. We didn't have any and we've over the past couple of years, the town's made some investments mm. in having a bylaw officer and gradually we're developing protocols and taking on some new areas of enforcement. Um, as that happens, we get to a place where we're able to ensure that as soon as we get a complaint, it's investigated and a uh, timeline is set. But the timelines tend to be at the discretion of our bylaw officer in line with what is being asked and the severity of the offense. So we have the good fortune of having a very experienced bylaw officer. Um, we're able to determine if, uh, if, if something needs to be rectified immediately within seven days, 30 days. Uh, but at the end of the day, the courts are the judge of the reasonability of that. So it's it's experience and reasonability, understanding the context and what's being asked. So it, it could be difficult to be too prescriptive in terms of those timelines. Like if we mm -hmm. said it will always be seven days or it will always be 30 days, it wouldn't really permit the context. And then the court would likely throw out our enforcement action for being unreasonable in the in the context. So that's just a little bit of background as how that works. But we have dropped the ball in the past by simply not having a function where we could ensure that there was immediate investigation and an immediate letter was issued. And now, now I can say we're much closer to that, um, certainly with respect to almost all of our bylaws. 
got a few old bylaws on the books that need updating. We do. Yeah. Councillor Feeney? <clears throat> it seems I, I believe, um, you know, we're building some consensus around, I think, Councillor Carver's view to tie the, um, you know, to, to tie the removal to the, um, to the, to the change of the government's um, COVID emergency um, timeline. So, I mean, that I can live with that if everyone else can. Uh, I, 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 would, I would pick up on uh, Councillor Burdick's su suggestion of uh, a timeline and then reapply or ha have the bylaw officer visit and uh, reassess the situation. Councillor Nell. Yeah, I think uh, we should definitely put that June 1st in. It gets them past the winter. So I would be prepared to make a motion that we give them until June 1st. And uh, if we decide to revisit it prior to that, then we can let them know that. But uh, right now, I think we should probably just give them a timeline of June 1st. I guess them through the winter and they can make arrangements maybe to uh, relocate it so it's not quite so visible. I would make that motion that we give them until June 1st. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Burdick seconds, moved and seconded that we allow the use of temporary storage uh, facilities in the town until June 1st. CAL, you had a comment? I, yeah, I just want to, uh, Richard, I'm, I'm sure you won't mind this, but um, how we had phrased this in the case of the brewery, and I think it's important to phrase it, is that we would suspend enforcement of the provisions of the land use bylaw respecting the location of the storage container there until the date that you specified, rather than that we would actually yeah. allow the container to be there until that time. Thank you. Councillor. Burdick sounds you're good to me. me. <laughs> okay. Councillor Burdick, you're the seconder. Are you happy with that? You've, you've heard the motion on the question. All in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you. Let's go to item 4.2. Uh, from the Quest organization, the Quest people. Mr. Hyde, will you speak to that? Uh, yeah, I can I can preface this. I'm certainly aware of the organization here. So this is, Quest is um, uh, supporting the Municipal Energy Learning Group here. So this is, um, I guess, an ongoing group. It's been going on since a lot longer than I've been a part of it. Um, Aaron Long has a, an involvement with it going back at least five years. And since I've been with the town, I've been involved. Oh, Maureen. Sorry, do we need, does uh, the deputy mayor need to note that he's returned to the discussion? Or yes, can I just note that in the minutes? Thank at, you. At seven, I think 719, he returned. All right, thank, thank you, you. Deputy Mayor. Mr. Hyde. Yeah, so uh, I was just going to say the Municipal Energy Learning Group, so uh, it's essentially a staff working group uh, for discussion around different climate uh, opportunities, energy opportunities, um, mostly for just sharing uh, knowledge and experience around the province. I, I, like I say, I've had the opportunity to be a part of a few meetings. Seems helpful, um, you know, just to be able to share those concepts between each other. In this case, the organization wanted to share some of what it had developed through engagement with municipal staff with the province, uh, essentially to say this is this is what we've seen would be effective uh, in the climate and energy area. And uh, they were told by the province, I understand that um, the opinions of staff being what they are, they'd love to know if municipal uh, council members actually <laughs> supported this uh, this this uh, statement. So that's that's where this came back, um, not in an organized way. I was just asked by email that put it in front of the council and I expect that it will be in front of councils around the province, um, essentially saying, would the councillors be willing to sign up to say that they support this? Now it's not the way we would normally do something where the town could express its support. They're it's set up as a petition. So essentially, you know, individual people would, would need to sign on to it. Um, I'm, I'm explaining that message. Uh, I can certainly take a message back saying that the, the council, you know, as a whole had a certain sentiment or the council here can reach a point where they feel that individual councillors could or, or could not be encouraged to sign it. But um, we did have an opportunity to discuss that we'd like to see it on an agenda here. So I can answer any questions. Um, oh, and I can put it up on the screen if you want. Perhaps we can get the um, the recommendations on the screen, uh, CAO. Sure. 
I've, I've had some interaction with this particular group as well. And, and I must say that their, their, their youthful enthusiasm for the topic is uh, quite refreshing. And they're, they're quite involved in their own particular areas with any numbers of project, projects that support these initiatives. Working as staff, there, are, there aren't that many elected uh, people uh, involved. And I only came to be involved because of the, um, the course that I'm involved with from FCM on uh, climate change. So I think this is the um, <clears throat> list of recommendations here. So there are a number of shortlisted 14. recommendations. I think, yeah, 14 shortlisted recommendations. I don't know if counselors had a chance to review them. I, I don't know if you want me to go through them. There's a lot there. Deputy Mayor. My, my question was around, uh, I think, it was said somewhere where I was reading, it was saying it's only 11 municipalities that are participating in this. And I was curious why only 11 um, and why the rest of the province is not part of it. I think it's generally ebbed and flowed over the years. The membership is just voluntary who, who participates. I would say the answer right now is those are the units that are most engaged in climate and energy work. So they have a staff person who is able to attend the meetings and participate. Um, in our case, somehow I am, uh, <laughs> but usually it means that there's a, a more junior staff person who's been assigned. And so it's the bigger, for the most part, the bigger units. Uh, and I guess a, a follow-up question, if I, if I may, um, what was around, um, I was also curious, well, having listened to Aaron, and this is still all very new to me uh, around area and, and what they're doing or what they, the challenges they face. Uh, in terms of the recommendations, I, didn't, I did not see anything that speaks to uh, a, a, some kind of regulation or some kind of uh, provincial assistance that uh, might be needed to ensure that uh, any predatory moves by a, a larger power provider affecting uh, what we're doing um, is, 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 doesn't compromise our ability to lower electricity cost or boost our production. I haven't seen anything that sort of uh, talks about that as a policy recommendation and I wondered whether it's the, uh, whether area staff are not participating in it or it was not deemed as a, as a provincial concern. Yeah, I think it's a very good point because it is a very central issue to, you know, exactly three municipalities and one electric commission. But uh, yeah, at the time when these recommendations were being developed, uh, Berwick and Edmaginish haven't been active participants. Um, area's been in and out. I've, I've been in and out. Um, we do talk about our context, but, you know, in terms of what rises to the top through surveys of the municipal units, only the ones that have electric utilities are impacted there. I will also say that, it, you know, not that we don't want legislative changes, but um, we've learned, I think, really effectively with area to to make plans that can work uh, even in the current context where a lot of the municipalities are stuck um, trying to identify a, a way to, you know, change the, the legislative context. So um, I know that's two partial answers. <laughs> Sorry, Francis, happy to um, get into a little bit more of the how we could go about uh, bringing that forward, and I think that would be a great thing to talk about. Councillor Feeney, um, Mayor, this you know I think this is an interesting opportunity. Um, the council should probably um, maybe spend a little more time with, and and I'd be inclined to make a motion that. Um, we, the council defer this item 4.2, um, the policy brief from the Quest organization until uh, one of the following, the next two following meetings so that uh, council I think can spend a little more time with this document and, you know, maybe seek out a little bit more information to have a kind of a more thoughtful conversation about where we should go next. Okay, so that, that would, uh 
defer it until the first meeting in January? If, you know, I think if, if, if everyone thinks that may be a helpful way to move, to move uh, forward with this item. Would certainly allow- I could, questions. I know it personal, personally, I could use a little more time with this, uh, with yeah. this policy document. Deputy Mayor? I, I agree with Joe, and, and I think what I probably would add to what he's saying, uh, uh, if uh, we can get the ability of somebody like Aaron uh, speaking to, to those recommendations to give us sort of his take on that, and, and, and I, at least from my perspective, whether it addresses some of the concerns or challenges they face, or whether there's anything that can be added on to that. Okay, CAO. Uh, so uh, happy to produce a staff report, work with Aaron on that. I know I have some thoughts about those recommendations as well. Just two things to clarify. One is I think we should, instead of getting a motion to defer, get a motion for staff to do a report looking at those recommendations and their applicability to us. And then also I just want to clarify because it makes things a lot easier. Can we do just the 14 rather than the like extended list of 70 in the appendix? Yeah. Okay. Fair, fair enough. To do it for me. <laughs> so somebody I'm can... Sure uh, <laughs> Uh, th thank you. I just ha I had a couple of questions about items in there, just for information. Is it true that municipalities can accept financing only from the Municipal Finance Cor Corporation? In terms of us accepting financing in the long term, yes. So it is true. Okay. Let me let, um, and does the MGA prohibit tax uh, the municipality providing tax ex exemptions? Uh, it, that would depend on, we can provide tax exemptions to prop properties owned by nonprofit organizations. Uh, is that what you- A Nonprofit, okay. Yeah. yeah I'm, yes, I'm just asking about items that were in here in, in their explanatory notes. Um, it, 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 I was just trying to understand them better. I was pleased to see in their item, appendix number 51, but wasn't in their 14 that they wanted to enable communities to re reduce their speed limits. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we would, uh, the CAO, would you like to give us some wording on the motion you're proposing or you're suggesting we consider? Sure, I, I would say that council direct staff to produce a report on the recommendations of the um, Municipal Energy Learning Group and their applicability to the town and its electric utility. For January. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, we won't get it to you by December 8th and I think it's important we get it to you as soon as we can, so January. yeah. January, okay. So that's the, that's the motion. Do we have someone to move it? Councillor Wilson, seconded by Councillor Feeney. All in favor? Motion's carried. Good old. Well, let's go. Item five, correspondence. We have two information items. What is the wish of council? Councilor Gerber? Move to receive and file. I was waiting for the deputy Hello. mayor to do that. <laughs> I'll second it. Do we have a seconder? Councilor now seconds. Move to uh, receive and file. All in favor? You know, Councillor Noss is voting in spirit here when we do that one, right? Okay. I'm sure That's he's on YouTube separate. right now watching this meeting. <laughs> uh, let's go to staff reports. CAO, you want to put your report up on the, share it on the screen with us? Sure, yeah, we got the, the big one to start off there, so. As usual, 41 pages this time, everything's updated. <laughs> I'll take some questions if there are any. Councillor Burdick. Uh, I had a question about the first matter, uh, which was about the acknowledgement. Um, and I, I know that there's gonna be a report on that. So should I hold off on that? <laughs> oh, I mean, it, it depends on your question. Is I could oh. you could ask it, and I could tell you that it might be covered in the report. Okay. My, my well, my question is: uh, Has have people been consulted on this, uh, uh, Mi'kmaqi folks locally? Um, and the other question I had, which might come up in that, is also: Is there a specific specific name 
for the territory that we're on that we should be referencing? Uh, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say the two answers are related, so I'll answer them separately. Uh, we do have a specific name that, we're, that we've used in our signage and other materials. Um, I believe that that comes from working with the local museum. So um, uh, it didn't come as a result of, of engagement activities. Um, on the subject of engagement activities, there's not been any specific engagement plan assigned to this item. Um, I think in part that's because the council's public engagement policy came after the decision to defer this. So it may be that now in light of that policy, we want to consider if there is some engagement plan that ought to be prescribed here. Um, but otherwise, no, there, there was not a direction as far as a specific engagement plan, um, simply to allow for an opportunity for comment. Deputy Clerk, would you have a, a comment or Clerk, would you have a comment on your, um, your research and in preparation of that, of those statements? When we presented this report in April, uh, the information we presented was from our consultation with the Department of Aboriginal Affairs, the provincial department. And we also worked with other municipal, well, we researched other municipalities to find wording they used. Okay. And the intention, I think, if I re recall, the second motion on the 14th of April uh, was that we would address the work or speak, refer the work to the local First Nations representatives in December. Yeah, we, uh, I mean, it's the way that it's worded on the screen here is the way that it was worded. So it, to ensure an opportunity for feedback, um, but but come December, if council wants to prescribe, you know, the, 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 re, the reaching out in some manner according to our engagement policy, then that, that is on the table. Okay. All right. Do we have another item on the... Sorry, um, excuse me, how, how, how would the... Um, how are you planning to get that feedback for, the, for December the 8th? Sorry, um, Councillor Carver, there might be some misunderstanding. So uh, staff are not carrying out any engagement activities relative to this topic. On December 8th, Council may prescribe some in that now we have an engagement policy. Under the engagement policy, Council is to request an engagement plan and there's some certain specifications there. Again, we didn't have that policy at the time when this motion originally arose at Council. Okay, and I, I, I think there may have been some confusion about the intention of that um, mo uh, motion or direction, but can't go back. <laughs> okay. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I really have three questions, and I'm sorry if this just takes a bit of your time because just getting up to speed. Um, first of all, on the water plant, um, I asked by email a couple of weeks ago if we could get some numbers that would give us a sense of how that, how they're operating. Specifically, I'm wondering if we could find out, probably on a routine basis, um, how much water is pumped out of Oakland Lake, how much of that water is processed, and how much of that water is actually sold and money is collected for it. I, I'm just very curious to know what our losses are now compared to what they were a few years ago, um, and I would note that our, our costs, uh, as I noted the other day, are significantly higher than both Lunenburg and Bridgewater's in terms of how much we bill our uh, customers. So, and I know it's an issue in the town. So, I'd, I'd appreciate it if those numbers could be included in these, this report. Um, the second question is: I, I noted that in, there's a, a just a comment in here that says ICIP funding of a community hall is, is awaited. And I'm wondering what does the term community hall mean? Uh, so I'll address the first one and then the second one. So the first one, Kelly, thank you. Uh, sorry we didn't have that in here. In the next 
report, uh, the one where we update the stats part, so that would be the second January meeting, we'll add those stats to this report. So you'll see it there and definitely remind me if you don't, and then it'll be on there on a monthly basis. Well, even quarterly is fine. I mean, it's, it's fine. That's great. Thank you. And as far as the question, um, uh, so in, in this case, <laughs> what we're referring to by the community hall would be a replacement for the uh, hall portion of the current fire station and hall. So um, we're replacing, as you know, there's a project to replace the uh, fire station in town. It's already underway, but that project is not intended to replace the hall. The uh, Mahone Bay Volunteer Fire Department approached the town with a proposal that they um, be able to fundraise and obtain external funding to build a new hall that would not have any direct cost to the town. So there was an application for funding under the ICIP climate mitigation stream to be matched by funding raised by donation um, that would, it would essentially pay for 73% of the proposed hall project. Um, that's still up in the air. We haven't heard anything since it was submitted at that, uh, in September. Okay. Um, thank you. And I would just, I, I, I would let uh, council know that a couple of days ago, I resigned my position on the board of the Mahone Bay Center. But if I could just put that hat back on again, I'd just be happy to let people uh, know that there's space up there for rent and that building is called a community center. Um, my last question is uh, the electrical rate study. Um, I didn't understand it and I'm not sure what it is. And, and how, does it, uh, how does it relate to our electrical costs compared to what NSPI is charging people outside of the town? That's a great question. Um, so our electric rates have to be approved by the Utility and Review Board. And the way that you seek rate approval is to do a rate study and submit it to the board. So our last rate study was about a decade ago. Um, since that time, we've been eligible to receive flow through rates from NSPI as we were purchasing all of our purchased power from NSPI. So we've been um, essentially whenever they would do a rate increase, we would do a rate increase. And uh, more recently, we, we've moved away from purchasing from NSPI, and uh, there was an intention to, to at some point, apply for a rate study, uh, or sorry, apply for a rate uh, review by the Utility and Review Board. Um, we would not be able to, to do that automatically anymore. So the intention would be to have um, specialists come in. We, we've used a contractor in the past for this to uh, review our rates, review our what we're currently purchasing for, the operating costs and capital costs associated with the utility over the period and determine an appropriate rate going forward or, or to uh, approve rate proposals for various uh, rate classes that would come forward from the town. So it's, uh, it's a periodic process, um, but one that we, we did originally anticipate happening this year um, Berwick, as it notes in the report, has is, is in the, the middle of a process. They have a hearing coming up in December. Um, theirs is considered kind of a test case for the rest of the municipals because we're all 10 years out from having previously gone to the board. And there's a lot of, a lot of questions that have come up in Berwick's rate application. So um, we're just staying tuned. And but the intention would be to, to complete a study as a prerequisite for going uh, with an application in the future. Do, do we have any notion at this point of whether there'll be any cost savings for the actual electrical consumer? Because I know that as of right now, our costs uh, per kilowatt hour are essentially a wash with NSPI and our uh, base rate charge or whatever that thing is called, the fixed rate is about 30% higher. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it currently depends on the rate class, and it, it, it would it would depend on the rate class in that case as well. There's been some discussion about um, how our uh, rates for larger industrial users, for example, compared to NSPI. Um, yeah. So there's a lot to review. There's also the importance of acknowledging the need for reinvestment in the system. So you had noted uh, recently in conversation one of the issues with the water utilities high rates yeah. is that we're we have so much line replacement to do, and we're required to plan ahead for our share. And we will be running into the same thing with the electric utility because of the age of the uh, depreciated infrastructure. So I uh, can't say for sure whether there would be any rate reductions coming, but it certainly is a part of that process to see if there, if there could be. 
Yeah, I, just, I bring it up only because I remember that the unique selling proposition of the uh, area in the first place was that there would be a savings generated that would be passed on to the consumer, and that doesn't appear to have happened. Now, if we come in, I should just want to quickly note, if we come into a carbon pricing environment, then we, we will swiftly find that we, our prices are much going to be much better than an SPI. But right now, obviously, we, uh, we're not really getting a whole lot of uh, financial benefit for, for the renewability mix that we've got over SPI. Uh, on the cost side, Dylan, or on the rate side? We're certainly benefiting on the cost side. We're we're benefiting on the on the cost side relative to NSPI prices. Um, Absolutely. In terms yeah. of the price that they would otherwise be able to 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 command, though, if we if they were getting carbon priced for producing the way that they are, our relative price would also be a lot better. Like there's no real yeah. problem right now for them when they burn coal. They're able to do that at a very affordable rate. Our wind costs yeah. are pretty fixed, Absolutely. but as their coal costs go up, our wind costs will look even better, I guess is what I was trying to say. Fair, fair enough. But I think, you know, from a policy perspective, and this is a kind of a longer conversation, you know, strategically, you know, everything that we've done is really around trying to find efficiencies on, on, on cost of goods sold, Kelly, um, into the utility. And to be frank, it hasn't been, hasn't been very successful yet. Um, and we've had a very, very significant increase of fixed costs, which you are easy to see if you take a look at the electrical utility financials in the year over year, um, and you know pretty chronic operating losses. Um, but that it's always been my understanding that the rate to the consumer has is also reflecting, you know, those lower costs and the lack of profitability of the utility. So, you know, I believe that our utility rates to the consumer are are materially cheaper than. Then say somebody in New Brunswick on a per kilowatt, this is someone in Mater's Cove, for example, on a on a on a uh, per kilowatt basis. I think we're about eight percent favorable on rates. To my understanding. Uh, no, no, you're not. The difference is two one hundredths of a cent on, on residential. Yes, on residential. Huh. I stand corrected. If that's the case. Well, I just have to look at it tonight because we're mm. we're not on the. Uh, Home Bay Electric, so I happen to be looking at my electric bill. <laughs> we also have, I mean, there, there's a number of different oh. uh, pricing schemes that are in place, like depending on Nova Scotia Power has a lot more options uh, for rates and rate codes than what than what the town has as well. Yeah. But uh, there's another thing to note there, which is the investment in the Ellershouse Wind Farm, um, not entirely intended to be an investment to the benefit of the utility. It's an investment to the benefit of the town. So the, the town actually receives dividends through area um, in addition to what the utilities benefits are. So there's a, I guess, a two-part rationale for that investment. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you, that's, uh, I'm done. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, Deputy Mayor. That's fine. Um, I, I just wanted to, uh, I hope you don't mind, mind, mind this. I wanted to bring us back to the very first item uh, around the opportunity to engage uh, local indigenous community and, those, and I guess uh, in trying to figure out the processes. Why wouldn't we uh, 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 do a motion to, to, to get that process going rather than wait for December 8th? I guess that's my first question. Uh, it's already up here. We should, rather than having it on the agenda again, to sort of do the same thing, to me, uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, do, you, do you want me to ask all of them or just have you respond to one first, Dylan? Whatever is most helpful, Francis, if it's helpful for you to answer, to have the first answer so that you can then decide. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. Um, yeah, I think, you know, this, this, motions anytime that something's been up here for a long time there might be something about it that, that could use a little attention right so yeah it's been up here since april um essentially uh, you know as councillor carver noted maybe this is a misunderstanding but at the time um a, a timeline was set but there was not a significant direction around what action could be undertaken in that time yeah, um yeah. So if there's an idea for an action that could be undertaken, especially again, now that we have a policy that gives a kind of a prescribed way forward to engagement, then there's no reason that that can't happen at any point. 
I guess all I would say is if council does direct us to develop an engagement plan with respect to this, that probably we won't have it on the agenda for December 8th because it will probably take a little bit longer than that to do. But then you can yeah. save the time to directing us to do that on December 8th. Yeah, um, and, and I think you know over time council will find a way that they're comfortable with in terms of um, how we develop engagement plans. I think this is a very new uh, part of our process as a community. And I think also we're one of two communities to kind of have a formal engagement policy. So hopefully we'll find a way to make it work well. Councilor Gerber? Yeah, my recollection of that discussion um, of that mo and that motion is that the, the hope was that after the election and after the new council was in place, there would be the opportunity I, and I had literally imagined that staff would um, reach out to uh, a lo local indigenous community and whatever, whoever that might be or whoever that might involve um, to ask for some feedback about the uh, proposed statements. Um, so I, that's, that was my confusion. I really had expected that um, staff was going to, to reach out Thank you. CAO? Yeah, I mean, I think this is why we've developed the public but engagement. Dylan, yeah. your, your volume is, is fading out. It's very I'm difficult to get David to, hear you. to take a look at my computer here. You mentioned that to me recently. No one else has, but uh, if it's still a problem, I don't um, try to speak. And right I got my hearing aid in, so. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's faint for me, too. Is it? Yeah, it's very hard to hear. Okay. Uh, well, after today, I'll ask our IT people to take a look at my computer. <laughs> <laughs> but in the meantime, I'll just have to kind of yell here, which is usually not a problem for me. So let me know. Can you hear this at all? Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't mean to belabor this point, but there is no easy way to just get a sufficient answer. <laughs> um, engagement requires a, a plan that we all need to be comfortable with. And so we didn't do that here. And I think we can do that now. And I think that we have a policy that may help. And I also think that Francis had other things he wanted to say. So uh, so let him continue. Yeah, so can I can I move a motion to, um, to, to have staff come up with an engagement plan for how they will engage uh, indigenous folks um, and get that moving so that we don't have this item on the next agenda. At least you give them some time to do that. Yeah, can I, I move assume, assume you're asking David rather than me. Yes, yes from uh, my end, you can through do the that. chair. And, uh, yeah. Oh, it's it's up to council. It's my imp I was under the impression that we were working towards that December eighth day anyway to have feedback from the First Nations community in the area, such as it is. Um, but uh, Councillor Burdick. Yes, my question, because that, that, I think that's something that us coming in are not, I, I, well, I'm having a little difficulty understanding it is, I, I mean, how do, how do you get feedback if people don't know that it's being asked <laughs> in a way? Um, so there's a, a date to, but I understand that the language around it was something that I was, I was confused about. So the idea is that there'll be a motion suggested or initially on here was a motion suggested for December 8th to then engage and ask, ask local, local indigenous community for their feedback. Because mm -hmm. I know also there are questions about acknowledgements within the indigenous community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mayor, I believe the, the origin of this initiative is almost two years old now. It was mm -hmm. sort of post the, it, it happened, I believe, after Councillor O'Neill joined council midterm. Um, and it was an item that was discussed about, you know, kind of national trends around land acknowledgements. And the, the, theor the theme was, we didn't know much about it. And we should, you know, conduct some due diligence, work with, um, you know, with gover government partners and um, the Indigenous community to figure out if this was an important, respectful item to proceed with. Um, we ha it hadn't been the practice under the last council to make these acknowledgements on a regular basis, although we had done it periodically on 
you know, community-wide um, discussions. So I, I believe the issue is really around the formality of the acknowledgement and, what, and what's the protocol on when the acknowledgements would be used and what's the appropriate, most respectful language to reflect kind of the community's thinking around, um, you know, the, the wording of the acknowledgements. And that was all something that at the time we've never had that, you know, subject matter expertise on council. And uh, I know that the, uh, the clerk had been working with, with the, the various government departments on, on locking that down. And I think we heard an earlier version of that acknowledgement tonight by you. So, I mean, I think if, it, if there's still outstanding questions about how to proceed in a, uh, proceed in a respectful way, you know, I think we could defer this item beyond December 8th. And, and, uh, and if there is a requirement to uh, the deputy mayor's uh, perspective to engage directly with the local um, indigenous community, then, then, then that makes sense to do so. CAO, you had a comment? Yeah, just, I mean, with, with Councillor Feeney's synopsis there, I think that's accurate. There was an effort to develop a statement. We, we did develop a statement. It was approved by Council in April. Uh, after having approved it, there was some question around whether that had had enough engagement locally. Um, without prescribing any form of engagement, Council said maybe it hasn't had enough engagement locally. And the motion that is in front of you <laughs> was passed. In that time, as, as I've noted, we took quite a bit of time as a council to develop a way to do better when these type of issues come up. And I think Deputy Mayor is trying to utilize that, which I think is probably the appropriate way forward. Um, so, I mean, if, if staff is directed to develop an engagement plan, we can put it in front of council. And instead of saying, I thought someone would talk to someone and we'd have an answer, we'd know exactly what we were going to do and we could be happy with it. I think everyone would be a lot more comfortable. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do, does that does that engagement have to take place between now and the eighth, though, Mayor? Oh, and it's and, entirely up to council. No, no. So I, I'm 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 specifically saying we, so rather than have this agenda item come back on the eighth, that we ask staff to go and do the due diligence to come up with a plan, and they'll bring it back at a later at a later date. We don't want something very quickly cooked. We want them to to give it time. Mm -hmm. To have a very good plan so that we don't have to talk about this on the 8th when they haven't finished it because i mean the time is too short for them Fair you make the motion deputy mayor i'll second it i i, I did uh, but dylan will, will will give it the, the the good words i guess <laughs> if you can give us the words to to help oh. you craft it well oh i i mean i think you did well mo did you want to jump in before i I was just going to say what I have already sounds okay, pretty go good, but go uh, that council directs staff to develop an engagement plan to seek feedback from the First Nations community regarding the town of Mahone Bay territorial acknowledgement. The only thing I want to add is to say an engagement plan in accordance with the town's public engagement policy, just so that we keep driving home how that works. Second. Okay. So you heard the motion moved by the deputy mayor, seconded by Councillor Carver, I believe. On the question, all in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you. So, so if I can finish my questions. <laughs> sorry, sorry to take up too much time. And I'll uh, bring it back up if you need me to, Francis, but I won't unless you need me to. So just let me know. As you... <laughs> sure. Uh, no, uh, they're pretty quick. I, th I think the one is not, not even a question. It's just uh, to point out that uh, on the traffic uh, speed signage, the one on Fobag Road doesn't seem to work and it tends to be very confusing. I, I'm driving there every morning back and forth and it, it uh, yeah, it's, it's just not working. So maybe we need to take a look at that. Mm. Um, yeah, just for, uh, to help us with it because we've had different intermittent technical issues. Is it not coming on at all or is it coming on but not correctly? Uh, not not correctly and, and it comes on sometimes and sometimes not, so. Mm. Okay. We know the tracking function is working, but yeah, there's been something wrong with the display. So we may yeah. actually just have to pull it. We, we wouldn't use it as much for tracking in the winter. So maybe that's a good time to pull it and do some maintenance. Yeah. Um, and then I was, can I was- still download the speed data from it. Yes, that's what I mean. So, so as long as they're out there, we're still getting the data and then we can decide to cut off the data, say at the end of November or uh, okay. at some point and then send it off to be repaired, hopefully. 
Yeah, I think the, the big piece for me is that if the residents are seeing that, they're probably thinking the town is paying for something that's not functional and <laughs> you yeah. will be getting that. <laughs> but maybe if they all speed when the thing's not working and we still get the detection, we'll find out how much people speed when they think the thing's not working, which might yeah, be some good data. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my next question was, uh, I was curious, it's something that's already happened, but I was wondering what the rationale was for the purchase of a used truck uh, for use by public works um, um, at a, quite some cost. And I mean, I, there, there probably was some very good uh, rationale to it, but I was just curious what that was. Yeah, I think it's, I guess there's two ways to answer it. I think the, the easy answer is that, you know, that's been past practice and uh, it's generally considered to be the most affordable way to go. But that does suffer. I think the longer answer is from a lack of long-term perspective or any kind of fleet management plan. So within asset management, that is one of the things we're trying to bring under. It's, it's probably the last of the different asset classes, to be honest, to turn the focus to. Um, but my expectation is we'll have a plan that will also include conversion to electric vehicles as part of our climate plan and something like a running around truck. Um, we're probably not that many years away from an electric vehicle replacement. So hopefully we're getting a used vehicle now because who knows, maybe we'll have an electric or hybrid electric truck when we go to the replacement. But yeah, the long answer is we don't have any kind of comprehensive plan to really look at the use of maintenance of costs associated with, but the intention is certainly to develop one. I think just one com just one comment on that on that uh, just to put it into some context. That was a bu a, a budgeted item, and I believe actually Derek um, found the used truck about nine thousand dollars less than the original budget. So um, it uh, it may be a little more used than we originally expected, but it was definitely well priced. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I get that. My my concern is that if personally, if I'm purchasing a truck, I probably will not buy that kind of truck for that much money. And, but that's just a personal, I guess, mm. um, perspective on it. And so I, I was just so wondering, is it very good use of um, the public coffers? But uh, that's all done. Maybe going forward, we need to, to be from my perspective, we need to be to to be making decisions that are, I guess, thinking thirty years or twenty years in advance, rather than just making making it for a fix, a very quick fix, because that would be a hole that you're digging all the time, right? Other questions, Deputy Mayor? Okay, sure. sir. Thank you. All right. Anything else for the staff report to council? Any other questions for the CAO? No? Okay. Let's go on to 6.2, the staff report on the, our council policy and also our committee policy. So uh, these are on council's agenda as part of a typical review. We, we have a new uh, council term. These policies are living documents that are intended to facilitate council uh, business and the business of committees that support council. So they're on the agenda for review uh, as any time with policies, we would need to be directed to bring back amendments, which would then need at least one meeting for council's consideration before adoption. So we're putting these up here now, um, not specifically saying we need requests tonight. Uh, there may in the course of council, getting more oriented, uh, can certainly leave these on the agenda for direction at the December meeting. But if anyone has thoughts now about drafts that they would like to see, potential changes, or wanting us to look at different options, then um, certainly you can make it. And if somebody comes up with something next meeting that we didn't think of this meeting, um, you can still bring that back up as well. I mean, it's a, it's a work in progress. So you don't have to do anything tonight with this. It will be on your next agenda, or you can, or you can ask questions. But please do. Councillor Carver. So if if we don't get into the weeds of the details tonight, uh, what would be the process for getting ideas to you before the next um, meeting for you to, to absorb the suggestions? Do, do you want us to send you emails just, just to staff? Do you want us to send emails to everybody? 
I, I mean, I think sending emails to each other is the best thing to do because you're probably going to send them on the exact same subjects. But even if you do send emails around, that's only for each other's information. Ultimately, um, when we come back as council on the 8th, we'll have to go through those suggestions. But it may help councillors in terms of that debate and that discussion to have the chance to circulate some some suggestions. And like I say, if you're having a suggestion around a specific idea, like how long in advance meeting packages are prepared, it doesn't necessarily make sense to have three or four different suggestions um, when you could be maybe working that out in advance. So, um, but it, ultimately we can we can talk about it on the eighth, and we can also, uh, as we have done in the past, if needed, schedule a specific time, a special session time to, to talk about it in detail. Um, so those are all options available. I know right now it's, they're just new on the agenda. Okay. Deputy Mayor? Um, so so uh, are we saying we should not go into the weeds now and, um, and, and, and table it to the eighth? Or I thought today we were supposed to go into the weeds or by the eighth, if there are any changes, it's a, it's a matter of putting in a motion or not. If, if you're ready to request that staff come back with a draft of something, Francis, I, I would say go ahead and do that. Okay. Uh, but I don't want anyone else to feel like the ship has sailed. Oh, Maureen has a comment. Maybe she doesn't want you to go ahead and do that. <laughs> no, she, she's good. So you can certainly do that, but no one else has to feel that if they don't get it in tonight, that that's, that that's it. That's all uh, yeah. I want. Yeah, and, and fair enough. Yeah, I'll, 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 I have, have a list of stuff. So I'll let, I'll, I'll let uh, Councillor Birdy go first, I guess, and I can come back. Not seem to, to be taking, taking the floor too much. Councillor Birdy? Yeah, I, there were uh, definitely a lot of things that came up the other night in our discussion about um, uh, sort of ways to go, orientation, what our plans would be. Uh, and there's some really specific things that I think we need to talk about before we before we get to the eighth actually too. So I'm really, I, I do want um, ideas about, for example, uh, the committee of the whole to be discussed. Um, Cause it does seem like there is a bit of a deadline also in terms of January coming up and, and information being available to people about upcoming meetings and what, what the schedule will be. I, I'll let Mo talk at one second. I just want to say, with as far as that goes, Alice, that uh, ultimately it is always discretionary, but there are a lot of benefits in council getting information out to the public, especially around the committee stuff. Um, you know, we don't have to go out and recruit committee members in December, but we have in the past gone out in that time frame. So if we're going to deviate from that, if council's still working on it, absolutely, council's prerogative. It's not going to be the end of the world if that advertisement goes out a month later. But we'll do our best to kind of let people know that it's coming and, and what to expect. And, you know, Maureen uh, nodding, she's got a lot to do with that since she's doing all the messaging. Mo, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, just to say that after that discussion at orientation, um, I have the draft of the next mayor's newsletter almost ready to go. And um, as we discussed that night, I've just got the 2021 solid waste collection schedule on the back page with a note in probably a couple different places in the newsletter, just to say you will see your um, regular meeting schedule um, in the near future because council is reviewing these policies. Um, not to presuppose what council is going to do, but in the interest of getting the newsletter ready, I have that little text block and it can change or be deleted or be, I can expound upon it, whatever the way to go is. So we actually already do have a plan if that's the way council chooses to go. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Deputy Mayor? You're on mute, uh, sir. So sorry about that. Um, I, I, I'm ready to sort of give some of the thoughts on, on, on uh, especially the council, council policy. Um, and I can I can type this and send it later, but I, I, would, I would love for us to have a conversation because it's not a matter of just putting it out there, but having a conversation because you folks who are in on council before might have some rationale as to why things were in a particular way. And, I'd love to have that, I guess, dialogue. Um, 
so so for, from from my part i think one of the things that's slightly confusing for me is um, on the agenda part of the council policy um the, the how do staff how do uh, council and public contribute to the agenda uh has has sort of been it's mentioned and then it's sort of referring to something else elsewhere without specifically because of the way the policy is it doesn't have either bullet points or numbers so it doesn't refer to a particular follow up uh spot whereby you can sort of say this is how a, a councillor or the public is supposed to uh to contribute uh to the agenda so i find that a bit confusing and i think we can clean it up by specifying on the agenda part specifically how as a councillor i can contribute to the agenda excuse me just a minute um so uh, i think deputy mayor one of the easy things there would be to add standard numbering, which yes, this policy should have, and we've maybe gotten a little bit better with our standard policy templates at the beginning of the last one. So um, I think that would go a long way towards it. And we can look at how we'd restate or avoid, you know, too much restatement. Cause I, yeah. I think part of what's happening right now is that you don't, you also want it to be clear in the sections in which it is being referenced. So, yeah. uh, but point taken, I'm sure there's a way to clean that up. And, and, and specifically, I think the piece for me there was around so can can the public contribute to us to, to the council agenda or can't they uh it sort of seems to indicate they can but there's no way prescribed as to how if they wanted to they would be able to do so yeah so i think what happens is that under delegations and correspondence there's there's specifications about adding delegations and correspondence yeah but it's not clear that those are the ways that a member of the public can be added to the agenda so making that link more clear under the agenda item, I think would be the. Exactly. Um, and if and there's again, any other ways council would like to consider, that's obviously within your project. Yeah. Um, I, the other piece for me there is around the order of business. And I think I'd mentioned this during orientation. Um, uh, I find the fact that the fact that uh, uh, members of the public are given an opportunity to have, ask a question or speak after after council has already deliberated on items of the ag agenda. Um, uh, it for for me it doesn't come across as very good uh, community engagement in council and and what council does. And I would prefer for that to be moved to the front, maybe um, after delegations, whereby using the same same time slot maybe 10 minutes that it's it's shared equally amongst everybody who's speaking and if it's if it's uh, more than five people who want to speak maybe it's a hot topic in the community then uh, you have discretion to give people everybody who wants to speak two minutes max so that people are able to contribute because i find I, I, because i find that would be a good way for council to hear the voice of the community on an issue that is of interest to folks and add on to the information that they get in the package to make a good decision as, as they go forward. I hope that makes sense. Is it, so this is augmenting the delegation and individual component of the agenda? So the there, there, there are folks who, who do not want to be delegations, right? But they have things that they want to they have questions that they'd want to put up, but they're only given an opportunity to do so at the end. So if I, if I remember like uh, when I've come to council before as a delegation, the delegation does its presentation, council has, a, has an agenda item that the delegation is speaking to, council deliberates, makes a motion, makes a decision, and then at the end of it, residents are given an opportunity to ask a question. My thoughts would be, why not move it up? I believe, and I'm no expert, but maybe Dylan can chime in, that I don't believe council has the ability to make a motion on the basis of a delegation in that particular meeting. No, that, so for instance, if right now council has, a, has, a, has an agenda item to make uh, that, that, uh, that's talking about Airbnbs, as an example, 
that's that's already an, an agenda item that council is supposed to speak about. And then somebody or a group of folks come in as a delegation speaking to that agenda item. They will get the opportunity to speak to it, but a, a community person who is not interested in coming in as a delegation does not have that same, same opportunity the delegation has up until the, the agenda item has been discussed. Am I, am I making sense there? But, but uh, uh, Deputy Mayor, if, if we were contemplating, and we'll use the Airbnb notion, yes. but if we were contemplating uh, a bylaw yes. that was going to regulate the placement or the licensing or the operating or the, uh, the, the, the taxation of Airbnbs, yeah. there would be a public meeting that would have to be held. Yes. Once we had, we had the first reading of the bylaw, then there would be a public meeting to just deal with that topic. Mm. And for, for, for a bylaw, right? Pardon me? For a bylaw. For, for yeah. a bylaw. So if it's not a bylaw, then you wouldn't have that. Right? You, not necessarily if, at this point. Yes, if it's if it's if you if you're just having conversations that are not changing the bylaw, but you'll make decisions that will impact things forward. So, uh, so maybe maybe Airbnb is not a very good example. Uh, maybe it's a develop development agreement change that doesn't require or um, uh, accepting the logo uh, changes that doesn't require a bylaw or a public public engagement process, where is the public's opportunity to input to what's on the agenda before it's been decided? Yeah. CAO, and then we'll go to Al to Councillor Burdick. Yeah, so my, I just had a, a couple of questions for Francis, just logistically in terms of the, so the way the delegations work now, um, yeah. somebody has to fill out a delegation form, which essentially indicates why they wanna come speak to council. It could be for as little as 30 seconds. There's no prescribed minimum time. You don't have to make a slide deck or go to any of those lengths. I'm, I'm sure it's intimidating for yeah. people. Um, but one thing that we do have is a limit of two delegations trying to kind of keep to time. So I, I thought it was an interesting suggestion that you know something could be used in the delegation time slot. And I'm I'm essentially thinking that it's mostly just about building in miniature delegations, you know. So if people are willing to put their name forward and say which agenda item that they would like to speak to, that yeah. there can be a number of slots. It's essentially down to how many people are, are interested. Um, yeah. Part of the way I'm keeping in mind is that we're doing this remotely. So I'm, I'm just trying to imagine in my head how that would work in a remote setting as well as to be fair in, a, in person someday. Yeah. Councillor Burdick? Yeah, I think it is really important to have a spot um, if possible, <laughs> during meetings where people can just show up, essentially, um, even if it's, I guess, obviously, virtually these days, uh, to be able to have their say, even if they weren't available, say, to get their uh, information in, in advance. Um, I totally see, I, I, I do see what uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Kangata is saying there, because it's just, that is one of, I think this is one of the places where people are feeling like they can't, they, they're not being engaged or they're, they're sort of missing the boat. And if they don't make it on time, they, they aren't gonna be heard. Um, and if, it, there, if there are actual time limits on, on, that, on those uh, presentations, that would definitely keep things in mm -hmm. line. And, and I wanted to add that this is something other councils do. It's not just, um, um, I, I, I've seen it happen elsewhere where communities, community folks are given an opportunity. And if, if with a time limit, community folks would be respectful that council is spending time on, on something. It's just giving them the opportunity to be heard. Councillor Wilson? You're on mute, Councilor. Thank you. I think I, I think it's important uh, to understand the difference between making a presentation or espousing a position, which is what that first time slot is about, and asking questions, which I think is largely what the latter time slot is about. And I think there's room for both. And I like, I mean, I forgot, I've lost track, but who said that we could probably 
expand the delegation part or, or change the time limit rules to allow as many people as possible to make their positions known at that, in that earlier time slot and still have the question period at the end for people who genuinely are, don't understand what we just did. Okay. That's a great point that there's no need to remove the current thing to look for a new thing as well, yeah. Councillor Kerber. Yes, I, I absolutely support the idea of having something at the front end and uh, like de the deputy mayor, I've seen it happen in other councils. Um, and one, one example I remember was um, several people, about five people had just turned up, uh, unscheduled, but they just turned up. Uh, they all, and they all were actually concerned about the same issue, which was taking place in, somewhere in the county. And there was 15 minutes and it was divided up amongst the uh, five people. So they all had three minutes each and they spoke their words and it wasn't necessarily an item that was on the agenda even. It was drawing something to the attention of council in a very real, natural kind of way. So it, it, was, an, uh, it was an issue that wasn't even on the agenda that for, for that particular meeting, Councillor Kerber? It wasn't even on the agenda for that particular meeting at that count, that, the, that particular example. Okay. CA, um, oh, sorry, CAO, uh, uh, Councillor Now was, had his hand up. He was waiting to speak. Yes, uh, I agree. I don't see any harm in having that 10 minute time slot uh, at the front of the meeting, probably behind the delegations and uh, people can come in and voice their opinions on whatever. It doesn't necessarily have to be an agenda item for that night, but if they have a concern, it might be something that happens on their street that they have a concern about that they wanna bring before council, that they have that 10 minutes. If there's 10 people, then you get a minute each. It depends on how many people are there that want to have a say, but uh, I think it's a good idea to have that uh, 10 minute time slot in there. Thank you. CAO? I, I just, I guess, again, I want to note that the delegation slot as it is currently used is available for that purpose. So I think the councillors will need to consider what the difference that they're looking to, to make here is. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I don't believe we will be able to accommodate people showing up and during the meeting deciding that they have an interest in participating um, just logistically right now, uh, we would say when we put out the agenda, if you're interested, there is a slot of time, you can contact us, we'll give you the participation link to join the meeting in a, in a controlled fashion. So um, I, I, I'm not entirely sure we can look at it, happy to look at it, if directed, we'll, we'll look at all the options that we can facilitate the um, kind of just drop in style. But I'm sure that up into a reasonable time frame, and the question is how far ahead people could register to participate. Mm -hmm. Okay, Councillor Now is next. Yeah, if I just might add, I was uh, thinking that that would work better in a person on person when we have our get back to our person in person uh, meetings. Uh, I can see there's gonna be some problems when we're doing it virtually because in order to get on there, they have to be invited into the meeting. Uh, clerk, can you control people getting in or not? Yeah, we can do that really easily. Um, it would be a um, just the Zoom link that you receive for normal committee meetings and stuff, mm -hmm. not the panelist one that you get for when we do this. That would be really quick. We could manage that. Okay. I guess now that we have a waiting room mm -hmm. function, we can do that. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not in favor of having uh, anyone can show up and have at any council meeting unannounced um, and talk at length on any topic. I think we have longstanding protocol that's worked. Um, it's been respectful and it's been more importantly, orderly. We, we've recently had a policy change to our correspondence and the requirements of written correspondence um, needing to meet certain hurdles just to get onto the council agenda, specifically names and addresses. I, I think that, that we would also have to use that as a guide on, on who could show up in, you know, unannounced at a town council meeting. Um, there is a, there's a longstanding process to, to get on an agenda. The town 
council has always been embracing of anybody who wanted to come and take time through that delegations and individuals um, section. But you have to let us know who you are and what you want to talk about before you show up at, at, at the town hall meeting. And if you have collateral material to speak to the topic of the day, it's generally more helpful if you provide that to council before the meeting starts. I think that there is a, re there is a requirement and it's worked well for us to also focus on our response to correspondence from folks who, who live in the town limits and, and which is something we dealt with uh, around the creamery issue and the vending bylaw where we had dozens and dozens and dozens of letters from people from all over Canada on the topic. Not every one of those letters made it to the council agenda because we have certain criteria on what is required to get onto the council agenda. One of those requirements is you have to be from here, you have to live here, you have to give your name and your address. So I think that I think that we should just be a little bit cautious about, about moving materially away from longstanding, you know, traditions and protocols. And we should be, we should be a little more thoughtful about what we're trying to achieve and try to use the existing frameworks to make that 10 minute, 20 minute, 30 minute period at the beginning of the council um, more, more, you know, have a higher level of utilization. I think we, we probably get a, what, a delegation every third meeting or so? Maybe. Yeah. Uh, maybe. So um, there are certainly an opportunity at every council meeting, including this one, for any interested member of the public to come in and talk about any of the agenda items, which is one of the reasons why, why the agenda item is posted several days before the meeting happens. Okay, thank you. Deputy Mayor? <laughs> With all due respect to uh, Councillor Feeney, I think one, one of the things that I wanted to point out is uh, the traditions and, 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 and uh, things that have been in place in many ways have stifled uh, some voices that are not able to come to the table because you've put process in front of them coming to the table. I want, for me, one of the big pieces that I would want this to achieve is to allow people to feel that they do not have to have all that formality. They do not have to, to fit a certain frame for them to show up at council, that council listens to all voices. I do understand the concerns about people from away and we can put things in place to make sure that that does not happen. Even using Zoom, you have a waiting room whereby in that waiting room, you can vet what's your, what's your address, what's your name. And that's something that can be checked before somebody uh, somebody is allowed to now come and, and, and be part of the, of the meeting. So I think checks can be done on that. What I hope we, we don't do is continue to stifle the, the opportunities for other people who might not have the voice to come and voice things at the table. So most of the time, I think what's, what I've observed so far has been, it's people who have, I would say, uh, the understanding of the, of the workings of council who are able to come through a delegation or who are able to come because they know there's an agenda item. Some people are impacted by decisions we make, but they don't come to council because they don't feel they have that opportunity. Who will listen to me? And then they will be on the side somewhere in the street or in the community talking about an issue. This will give them the opportunity to know this is something I can do. I can go up to council and just talk about what's affecting me. And for me, what better way to engage the community than that? I appreciate your, your concerns about uh, um, that we might, our meetings might get even too long or there might be issues that will come to the table that are not supposed to be there. But, but I think test the community and you will find that you will have, I guess, more productive council meetings. I, I mean, there, in, this, in this county, there are councils that do this. It's not something that, it's not something that's not done. Uh, it's something that's done in, in this county and, and, and in this province. So uh, think about mm -hmm. that a little bit more, I think. Thank you. Councillor Burdick, you're next on my list. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I can see that it's a little bit of a daunting subject because of the tradition um, here in terms of process. Um, I don't think, I do, I do agree with, with the with the deputy mayor on this one. And also as somebody who's been an event planner in my past, um, poetry readings, for example, um, 
you can, <laughs> there's actually like protocols in, in various arts thing, uh, arts uh, events where um, it's, uh, you, you come in maybe half an hour before you give your name, your contact information. And maybe in this case, you give a sense of what you'll be wanting to talk about also. So there's a slight, you know, there's that moment of a basic overview for the person giving their information. Um, and, and it does, I do think, but I do think this is obviously something that we all want to talk about a little bit more. <laughs> it's clearly a contentious issue, so. Councillor Carter. Yeah, um, I hope I didn't uh, lead things astray earlier when I mentioned uh, topics from all around the county. I let slip the, the fact that I was at a, a modal council meeting where that was taking place. So what I was referring to was something uh, totally within that municipal unit. It was not people from outside that municipal unit at all. I'm also concerned about the time. It's 25 past eight now. Um, and usually we end by nine. Um, so I wonder if we can continue this conversation by email amongst ourselves. Um, and uh, if we have, if we want to perhaps send some uh, ideas into staff to come back with some suggested or <laughs> recommendations the next meeting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Count, um, uh, CAO. I'm not going to belabor it. I just wanted to really quickly say that when Councillor Feeney said you had to put your address, you, you didn't have to be from town. You just have to tell us where you're from. We're absolutely happy to hear from people who don't live in town. We just want to know where they're from. I just wanted to clarify that. That's right. I, I misspoke there. That's right. Okay. Clerk? I Ms. just wanted to note the, um, the comment about sending ideas through email and sending them to staff. Absolutely, that's great. And we can research what we find. I, there is one week from today is when we release the next agenda. So there may not be enough time for that to end up on the December 8th council agenda. And that's, you know, that we'll, from a staff perspective, like I said, we already know what we'll do um, if we're not in a position to release a meeting schedule for 2021, that's fine. I did want to bring up the fact that, that there may be a delay because of that. Okay. Well, there's clearly a lot of other subjects that council still aren't gonna wanna talk if we're not probably going to amend the bylaw for each idea. So no. if someone wants to make a motion on the next one that um, a specific report, a specific policy be brought forward, then we can, but um, in between now and then we might get a lot closer. And I would hasten to point out that this is only the 14th day in the life of this council. And I, I absolutely agree with the deputy mayor uh, that uh, there are some fundamental changes that we should be considering, but we don't have to have them all done by Christmas, as nice as that would be. Anyway, anything else before we leave this subject? I just wanted to say thank you for, for giving me an ear. Uh, I'll, I'll send the rest of my lists on email. So we're going, we're going to send our comments to the uh, Town of Mahone Bay Council. Mr. Hyde and, and uh, Ms. Hughes, so everybody sees all the commentary. Okay, let's go to the Wayfinding Signage Project update. This is a topic we've heard much about, CAO. Yeah, I'm just bringing it up on the screen now. Um, so this one of a series of staff reports that is on here on the agenda um, that are updates, updates on ongoing projects that council um, was aware of and the new, the new council members will uh, be somewhat aware of, need to become aware of. So this report is um, essentially we're at a stage in the process where we have awarded our contract for design of wayfinding signage. Uh, but the designer is seeking um, clarification between three sort of templates to go ahead and produce additional designs. And this is what was required initially. Um, I will say that the templates that are being presented, they're 
you know, at this point, they're very high level. Uh, so there's there's some uh, package attached with, with drawings. The recommendation of the steering committee was because this is essentially a simple choice between three different formats, um, that this be something that be put out for a uh, quick form of engagement, um, you know, essentially uh, under the current engagement policy, um, when we do an, a, a plan of engagement, we're to identify who and how and when and where. Um, so essentially, this is this is the steering committee's recommendation as to who and how and when and where could provide some information to council to choose between these three options which would then be used by the designer to produce the required designs, which would then come back and council could submit them to additional public consultation or whatever you felt was appropriate. And I can take questions or if council doesn't feel that this consultation is necessary, I, you can also provide direction to go back to the designer about one of these three designs. Comments? So what were deputy mayor? I just wanted to say, I think the uh, consultation is crucial, but we don't want to land at a place where uh, you have the same kind of uh, feeling from the community that we did not engage them. So mm. I think they need to, to be engaged. So are, are we proposing CAO that we will send out, we will have a, uh, an online survey where our citizens will be asked to choose one of the three design styles? Yeah, the suggestion of the committee was, uh, as it says here, um, recommended resident or uh, respondents be asked to identify themselves as residents of the town and select between the options that are presented. And then there would just be a location for additional comment if there was any additional comment. So one choice between the three, exclusive choice, one of the three, and then an opportunity for comment below that. That was all we were going to include. And and how would they have to identify themselves for the purposes of the survey? Pick all the pictures that have got codfish in them or what? <laughs> oh, uh, but there would just be at the beginning of the survey, it would ask for people to input their address. Uh, it would be okay. a mandatory field, but you can put anything in a mandatory field. It's not going to be able to verify. Okay. Councillor Curver. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, CIO, could you tell us who was on the um, the members of the uh, project team? Yeah, so uh, I think that's in the reports there. But the project team is two members of the chamber uh, who were assigned by the chamber board and Maureen and myself. So two members of staff and two members of the chamber were on the project team. Um, and if we do a survey online, uh, the public engagement survey, uh, what, is council then bound by whatever numbers come in? No, <laughs> no, but uh, you know, like any public engagement, unless council has formally delegated any decision-making authority, you'd never be bound by it. It's just to provide information. But to go to the deputy mayor's perspective, if 49% of the people who respond to the survey pick option one, and the other two options each got approximately 25 points, we'd be hard pressed to choose one of those other two options, would we not? We'd, not you'd, have, you'd, have to, you'd have to ask the government that did the Sunday shopping plebiscite. That's, That's the right. last time Nova Scotia has been asked and they did the opposite of that. I think they stayed in power for a few years afterwards. I don't think council is abdicating responsibility to make a decision. We're just simply seeking this, you know, information to help, you know, give some guidance. Mm. Yeah. I as like long the as idea. Council knows that going into this exercise, that council still has the decision making capacity to embrace or not the obvious preference of the majority of our public. And that's what we're saying. Yeah. Okay. So, Councillor Feeney? One last comment. I think if we are going to do this, I think it's a, a grand idea. We, we really have to have some idea of what a reasonable sample size is. You know, so if we have 10 respondents on a town of, let's say, 
you know, what, what's a, what's re what's a reasonable amount of input um, so that the survey has, has some level of validity. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm hoping, you know, would we, would we, would we take the survey as being very, very helpful if we only have 20 respondents? Probably not. If we have 300, you know, a lot more meaningful. I, I do think that, that, that the CAO and, and um, Deputy Clerk should just think about like what, what's, what's reasonable from a statistical sample okay. size. Uh, Deputy uh, has, has his hand up next. Um, D Dylan looks like he wanted to respond to that. I'll give him a chance and then I can, what I wanted to say is just, I, I think in, in many ways, this is a very subjective decision. Uh, so having, having folks give their opinion is, is important because they help us, uh, I guess, uh, support whatever decision we land at. Thank you, CAO. Yeah, sorry, no, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I think I think Francis is gonna, you know, we unless anyone has a direct question for me, I, I don't want to belabor the point here. Um, we have an opportunity to solicit feedback. Uh, it's a very straightforward question that we're looking for an answer from. Um, we can't really, in a voluntary survey, prescribe a number of, of people. Um, you know, these things are about passion. So if people are not especially passionate about a subject, we may not get a lot of responses. And I think the deputy mayor says we're, we're opening, we're, we're listening, you know, um, people may not want to talk. If we do a good job of listening, we'll hear what people have to say. Uh, but, you know, it's not Australia. There's no $50 fine for not participating. Um, and I, and I, don't, I don't know what we could do to, to get the numbers up other than just be as excited as we can be about the subject. Mm. And, and how will we accommodate citizens who don't have an online opportunity? Um, that continues to be a, a challenge. Um, you know, at, at this time, I think, you know, we can encourage people to maybe help uh, other members of the community in that regard. Um, it's an accessibility challenge. I'd love to have suggestions. I don't have a perfect solution to that. Uh, the council may want to consider investing at some point in some form of a of a terminal or you know opportunity for people in a public location if you're going to have a lot of of materials like this. But uh, it's I mean it's very challenging. Do we have to give back our iPads from the election? Yeah. Uh, Mo's got her hand up. May Mo, do you have a? Councillor, or I'm sorry, Maureen. We're not getting any uh, audio, Mo. Can you hear me now? No, yeah, yep. oh, here you are. Um, this is something that we have the capacity to, as part, uh, to, uh, we have the capacity to do uh, from our perspective on the working group. But the other part of the working group that's been dealing with this is connected to the business community. So, um, you know, we could, I've gone to businesses in town and seen, um, you know, which do you think is better, like grape Kool-Aid or orange Kool-Aid, and you put your tip money in whichever jar, or, you know, these are, there are a lot of things we can do um, through our uh, partners in this on the Chamber of Commerce as well. Um, they can share the information through their, um, through their contacts, we can, um, I think that we can, we know we can set up this online survey and then we can work with the other people in the community to see what else we can do to find just any kind of feedback from people. In a, in a purely voluntary way, we're gonna stress here though. So if businesses wanna promote it and if people do participate, but we can't guarantee any level of participation. Councillor Now, you're next. And then Councillor Kerber. Yeah, I was just uh, going to say I would make that motion uh, to have the staff to issue the voluntary survey. I'm not sure we should include the online there because we might want to go another way with some other people that aren't always online, but uh, that we would certainly issue the voluntary survey regarding wayfinding signage design options uh, closing just before prior to the uh, council's December 8th meeting. Okay. Second that. Are you seconding? Yes, I was going to, I had my hand up to make the motion, but Councillor now was in there okay. first, so I'll second it. 
So the, the motion is that we direct staff um, to, to undertake a, a, a voluntary survey regarding wayfinding signage design options closing just prior to Council's December 8th, 2020 meeting. And as it would be done online or it could be done hydraulically or Councillor now suggesting we would not want to specify online because there should be other options. It, it doesn't have to be specified in the motion, but just based on capacity, we'll put the survey out online and we'll alert the business community. And as Maureen said, people can try to find other ways to voluntarily assist people, but we don't have the capacity to distribute a paper survey and bring response back to the December 8th council meeting. I, I just think it's an unrealistic thing during COVID especially. Um, if we wanted to maybe allow more time, if we want this to go into the new year, uh, but, you know, ultimately the reason here was to give the designer the opportunity to do more substantive designs upon which council may wish to obtain additional consultation. And I, I would suggest that, um, you, you know, I, I think the last time we did something where we made a lot of effort for a paper component, we got a single response in, in a paper format. And mm. <laughs> I just uh, appreciate the intention. Uh, I'm just not sure that that, that is ultimately that it's worth trying to say that there is another way to do this other than the way that was suggested. And I think it was important that the committee acknowledged the capacity to, to actually get responses back in the time frame. Okay. Okay. So we have the motion to proceed with the voluntary survey. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Motion's carried. Looking forward to that one to see what the output is. Okay, next item is the COVID-19 financial update that I think the, our finance manager was, has been quite busy with that, CAO? Yeah, I'm just loading it up here now. <clears throat> Number of updates there. Um, the main piece of news is the safe restart agreement being uh, agreed to, being rolled out by the province and the feds. Um, safe restart agreement is, uh, I guess at this larger. point, Can yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm have, just doing it. It's very hard uh, to read at that size. Sure, yeah. I, uh, every time I attempt to make it larger, the uh, Zoom menu pops up over it. So, sorry, one second. Okay. So, uh, like I was saying, the safe restart agreement was a, a negotiation between the federal and provincial governments uh, to flow money for uh, COVID-related expenditures or COVID-related loss of income um, to municipalities, not to utilities specifically, but we were given a, a survey early on um, and, and during our budget process had the opportunity to consider some impacts of the finance manager reports in here. I think we're, we're very you know, positive uh, assessment in terms of those impacts, if anything, um, we're not we're not seeing the negative impacts that have been projected in terms of the town's own finances. Uh, there's a loss of tax interest due to, uh, to essentially delaying on collections of taxes. Um, that's about the only actual loss. There's also some areas where we actually have come in quite a bit over projections in deed transfer and uh, and, and permit revenues uh, in the year. So as far as our assessment of where the safe restart money would be applied based on eligible categories, we end up looking at applying it to building renovation, which was, as you would have seen in the September 24th report, um, it was a projection that we would we would obtain um, up to 51,000 from COVID, whether that was the ICIP COVID stream, which to this point doesn't exist in Nova Scotia, or under the Safe Restart Agreement. So um, essentially what we've gone through here is an analysis of the uh, impact of that funding on renovation program. Uh, and then a, a little bit of analysis is included in here with respect to the property tax financing program under which we only received two applications despite extending eligibility. So uh, perhaps an indication that while the town's finances did not fare uh, as badly as expected during COVID also in the community impacts were not nearly as widespread as we'd originally estimated or, or uh, the estimates based on the provincial formulas would have led us to believe. Um, so all that is to say that the recommendation is to accept this report for information. 
but I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, I expect there will be questions. Councilor Carver. Yes, I have a question about the uh, the low income tax rebate and how that uh, figures in the COVID situation, because surely that the tax rebates that were given this year were based on 2019 pre-COVID. So I was just a little bit co confused why they were even included in the um, COVID situation. Yeah, I guess it's a two-part answer. When we were developing the budget, council had considered that there would be a possibility that additional um, uh, an additional uh, provision would be made. Uh, we didn't do that. Uh, that being said, despite the fact that it's based on last year's eligibility, we know from census records, we don't get uh, applications from a number of people who would be eligible. And so what's likely happened this year is that people have been looking for relief and maybe some people who previously had not been accessing the program, uh, even though they would have been qualified, then this year they are. So there, there is an increase likely motivated by the circumstances of 2020. Um, but yes, you're right. It would be last year's qualifying information. So next year, uh, there may be even more people yeah, qualifying it, as a result of what has happened this year. Yeah, it, it'll look different next year. Yeah. And the other question I had was, um, what, what, how, can you help us understand the huge range of amounts that were given uh, to municipalities? I mean, other small towns um, ended up with way larger amounts, which means that they had very different kinds of estimates of than we do. Yeah, it's it's essentially a two-part, I mean, we don't have transparency around the exact formula, but we're given to understand it's a two-part formula. One is the just per capita size of your municipal unit, but the other side has to do with the recreation and transit programs that you might operate. Mm -hmm. So if you have parts of your budget that are based on revenue from, from service delivery that you charge for, so, so recreation departments have a lot of service-based fees, uh, those areas were eligible under the survey, but a lot of units really emphasize that. To be honest, we don't have those type of programs. So we, we don't have rec department, we don't have transit programs. So a lot of the things that other units, you know, were able to mm -hmm. get compensation for, um, you know, to be fair, we, we don't deserve compensation for yeah. uh, because we don't offer those programs. So that, that would be the other part of it uh, in terms of the small units, but it is roughly proportionate to population and you'll see some there that you know town of lockport being so much smaller than us uh, fourteen thousand um, dollars that's even disproportionately low given their population is half mm -hmm. of what ours is so it's uh, it's kind of across the board there's not a lot of transparency about how they got to the numbers that's just what i was told okay Mr. thank you yeah. do you have a comment or question councillor wilson just, uh, I think it's semantics, but toward the end, it talks about RPS and the uh, electrical uh, mm -hmm. utility. And it says that we, I forget the number, but a bunch of money was not collected. And I suspect that that means it wasn't used. $75,000. But I'm guessing that it was just, it was not collected because it was never consumed. Uh, yes, yeah, it's it, it's a it's a deceptive stat in that it doesn't mean we lost that much revenue. We never had to buy the power in the first place. Right. No, but I, I guess what I'm saying is the implication there is that they stiffed us. Yeah. Oh, I see what you mean. Collections in that sense. No. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. That's just the terminology used here. So what mm -hmm. they're saying is that compared to the previous year, what we would have sold has dropped, mm -hmm. but it's not a drop in in um, uh, net. Uh, because we didn't purchase power either. Mm -hmm. So collections in this way does not mean collection of past due account. So and the utilities were not factored into the dollar amount that we received. No, no, no we're not allowed to put money from Safe Restart into the utility. Okay. Councillor Feeney. So uh, just to pick up on Councillor um, Wilson's comment. So when I read that, I didn't know what, I, I didn't know how to read those numbers. Um, the vernacular kind of not necessarily the language of, of, um, of like a financial report. So does that, are we saying when we're, we're talking, does that say that our revenues, we have a negative variance to our budget on revenues of 137,000 or is this a $137,000 variance to our gross margins? 
what 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 exactly are we supposed to take away from that? I'm assuming it's it's revenue. Yes, yeah, you're right about that. So and so it's probably given our margins, it's probably more like fifteen thousand dollar, you know, uh, gross margin impact. With with the water or electrical? I mean the margin. Uh, elect electrical. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the electrical is much, uh, you know, much less of an impact in that the cost is almost all purchased power. And if we're not purchasing more, we're yet. I think, you know, Councillor Wilson mentioned earlier in the discussion um, about, you know, the units of volume. And it's been something we've been talking about for a couple of years now about, you know, when we talk about the utilities, it really has to be in the context of rate volume discussions. I mean, that that's the only really way to glean what's really happening under underneath um, underneath the covers. So, you know, I think I'm not sure when our next audit committee meeting is. Uh, it's got to be after Christmas sometime. But that might be a nice opportunity for us to really kind of take a look at the both the utilities in the context of not only the financial performance but also the the consumption numbers. Um, you know, I think Councillor Wilson was looking for that on the water utility. Um, you know, and maybe at the next audit committee meeting, that would be a good time to visit that whole topic. Yeah, I think that's great. Uh, I know that Luke was working on electrical reporting for that meeting. And, uh, and I'm also just made a note just, you know, in between, we might as well also have electrical power sold and purchased stats in the monthly reports as well. I'm just at a high level. So uh, I made that note as well. Okay. Any other comments or questions? All right, thank you. Uh, 2020, 2021 transportation project update. One moment, oh. Deputy Mayor. You're on mute, Francis. What, wasn't there a motion there to be made before we moved on or? I appreciate that. Uh, there was a motion to accept for information. We don't always get those, but I'd okay. love it if somebody wanted to make a motion to accept for information, yeah. Do you want it now or will you wait till the end of these reports? Okay. Yeah, well, it was, for, it was for the last report. It was in respect of the last, the COVID report. Okay. Deputy Mayor, we'll take to do the honors. Yeah, I'd like to move a motion to accept the report. Second Seconded by Councillor Feeney. All in favor? Motions carried. Transportation project update. All right, so I know people have been hoping that there would be an update on the transportation project, and I'm sure this is not the update that you were hoping for because I'm not saying very much at all, um, but essentially we are still waiting on funding. Um, I just wanted everyone to be on the same page about why and, and what the consequences of that are. And at this point, um, there are some areas where the, the, the overall project or objectives that have been discussed by council the past year have some opportunities to move forward over the winter. I've tried to look at that with respect to the improvements on Kinburn Street, bicycling as a concept, but um, this report is essentially here to say, this is where we are. This is where staff understands we can be at this time. And if there's direction from council to change from the plans that we've had around this project uh, can take it or, um, have a recommendation there, um, but you know I know it's not with respect to getting boots on the ground with the with the construction improvements that we've talked about. So um, the recommendations with respect to engagement activities. Uh, Deputy Mayor, um, you, pro you probably know this is coming, Dylan. My 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 hope had been that uh, uh, there would be at least uh, an indication of for those changes that. Um, that are supposed to be done, there will be an, a number to them that sort of says this is how much this would take because uh, so one oh great, I did, I did not go down that, that far. Yeah, so that's that. there. It's a bit sinister though. Um, you know, I, I <laughs> went through this myself weird. thinking is there any magic bullet here in terms of, um, you know, yeah. that I would say one of these really doesn't cost $7,000 and yeah. I know it seems like a lot. Most times we're talking about a crosswalk, but in many places these crosswalks would end in nothing or intersect a hazard that would have an accessibility challenge. There's concrete work and other stuff. So it won't always be $7,000, but there's the breakdown. <laughs> Well, the, one of the things that 
th- and thank you. I, I hadn't gone down that far. Um, one of the things that for me, uh, I guess, is uh, comes to mind a lot when I think about this piece is that it's been, I think, two years since. Uh, I remember David saying a, a group of ladies came to to council to sort of say, "Well, we have this concern. Uh, our our kids are in danger when they are crossing." Uh, to get to school and and to be honest that's uh, one of the reasons why I walk my kids to school is to make sure that they get past that crosswalk and 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 so uh, it's a safety concern and my 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 thinking is uh, are we compromising safety because of uh, uh, of dollars uh, if, if there's something that uh, 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 that should take precedence over money should be the safety of our children. So is there some things, at least for me, at least one item there that we can, we can do and sort of say, well, we need to do this. This is, this is a safety concern. Let's fix this as we wait for the rest of the staff. Mm-hmm. I, I, I would like to urge council to think about just that uh, clear way uh, Main Street intersection that it needs to be addressed. Uh, it, it will be uh, uh, very unfortunate if we wait and, and uh, something happens there. It's not a very safe place to be. Councilor Wilson? Um, I agree totally with, uh, with Deputy Rick and Gata. Um, in particular, that one crossing, I, I get complaints every week from people, mm-hmm. big people, little people, all kinds of people. And I think that if, if we're doing our job properly, that somewhere in our contingency funds or our accounts here or there, we can find enough money to do at least that one thing. So I concur. Three-way stop sign at that corner would go a long way to fixing it. Councillor Burdick. Yeah, I totally agree. I've got kids myself and we live very near there and there've been so many close calls. Um, which is a little disturbing. I did want to point out on, on here, it says Clearwater, is that? Yeah, that's just the CBCL being a little uh, sloppy with that. I mean, I didn't okay. prepare that document, I so I don't, can't fix it. But yeah, okay. Main Street's also spelt wrong on there. It would be, oh, <laughs> it, it would be encouraging to people just to see one of these um, come to fruition. Mm. Well, the three-way stop sign is targeted at an $8,000 cost. Now, to do that one item, I think it would be very effective. It would provide that visibility to citizens. They'd realize, Councillor Wilson, that that we're listening to what they're saying. Um, and it may, as far as for, to the deputy mayor's comment, it may go a long way to improving the safe usage of that intersection <clears throat> by the school children. Councillor now. Yeah, I agree that we uh, should move ahead with that. And another factor to that point is that uh, when we discussed these points, we also felt that that three-way stop on Claire, on, between Clareway and Main would also go a long way to uh, slowing traffic down on Main Street. On Main Street, yeah. Mm-hmm. Councillor Feeney? So just bringing us back to the discussion we had on Tuesday evening around, you know, opportunities for council to be effective and anything that we can do to um, glean more support from the, our other provincial and federal government partners. I think, Dylan, it's fair to say that there were expectations when we applied to this program that there would be answers that would come in a more, you know, timely manner. Um, and this is a recurring theme, and it's a theme that you see all through the council report of, you know, has not started yet, has not started yet, has not started yet initiatives. So, you know, we prioritize our capital based on, you know, a blend of our mission critical requirements, but also the, the funding the opportunities that are provided to us. You know, we do our job and or Dylan and staff that they do their job, they apply and, and we wait patiently. I know it's been a strange year 2020 due to COVID and maybe things are delayed, but this seems to be not necessarily a delay, just it seems like it's things have been chronically delayed for several years. And this may be an opportunity for us to remind 
um, the MLA and the MP that, you know, to give them a bit of a status update of the applications that we have before the various governments and just to let them know that we applied, here's the date we applied, and, and we continue to wait because as the CAO mentioned last week, we're loath to spend $3 and we can spend $1 for the same um, community benefit. So I'm, I'm perfectly prepared to proceed um, as the deputy mayor uh, mentioned on a few of these light items if we can, if they're, if they're driven by safety, that's just, that's just logic. I think to, to staff's benefit, I mean, no one would have thought that we'd be here in December and we'd still be waiting to hear about these programs. I, I think we all had expectations we would have heard about these things many months ago. CAO, you're next. Oh, I just uh, I think Joe's absolutely right. This is this is the way the provincial funding cycle has developed. It's it's very unfortunate. It often takes until June or July for them to intake and typically takes three or four months for them to flow money. In this case, they really pushed this program and got a lot of applications. And as a result, they didn't uh, want to close applications till the end of September. Um, then they started considering those applications. I mean, the writing was on the wall that they wouldn't make this award in time. I would say the Connect2 program has only once in my memory over the past 10 years been able to successfully flow money while there was time to use it. And that I've accessed it almost every year in, in Shelburne and now in Mombay. Uh, but I also think that this is an example where it's about expectations, you know? Um, if we expect to receive external funding, we have to know by our budget time what we want and we have to get that application forward and it will be the following year before that project will happen. So if we're going to take advantage of the province's um, funding, then you know it really is about setting public expectations that by the time council makes the decision and directs it, it's, it's a two year process. Uh, the only other option is to act unilaterally. And I agree that sometimes council needs to decide to do that and we just need to clarity around, around when. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor is next, Councillor Carver. Oh, me next or? or uh, Deputy Mayor, I thought, had his hand up before you did. No, so sorry. I, was I haven't spoken on this topic yet. Is here. Okay, Councillor Carver. Thank you. Um, uh, I'd like to ask the CAO, do we need to um, get permission from the province before we can work on the clearway uh, stops? No. That's never been in, in question here, just in terms of funding. Okay, I thought there was I thought there was an issue about putting stop signs on provincial highways. It's not an issue for me. Okay. <laughs> um, that I would be prepared to make a motion then that we uh, go ahead with the work on the three stop signs at Clearway and Main. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Wilson is seconding. Okay, this is to just do the three-way stop sign at the corner of Clearway Street and Main Street. CAO, you have a comment? Yeah, just two things. Uh, assume it's the three-way stop. I know some people have referred to it as three-way stop sign. Um, I know it seems simple, but usually that's not all there is to it. So the three-way stop as properly constructed on the basis of the engineer's recommendations for lines of sight and blinking lights and forward signs and lines on the ground and all the other things that go into a three-way stop. Yeah. And uh, I just otherwise want to note that because there almost always is concrete in painting and it is November 26th that even with this direction and I'll do my best, but obviously um, it may not be possible to do the concrete in painting depending on the weather. Well, if you can't do it, you're going to have to go out and stand in the middle of the road with a little lollipop sign and stop well, all the traffic. Put up a tent over it, heat it up enough, and send everyone down Kenbury Street, I guess. Okay, we have a motion. All in favor? The motion is carried. So that'll be the three-way stop sign, hopefully. That'll be the council's Christmas present to our elementary school kids. Okay, uh, the last of the staff reports is on the solid waste hauling contract. Clerk or CAO, which? Uh, well, Maureen did prepare this report, but I usually do the screen sharing. Um, okay. One second here, I'll get that up on the screen and then. Councilor Kerber. I'm sorry, we, there was a recommended motion at the end of the Oh, um, uh, yes, thank report. you very much for the Penny, financial. We just so sidetracked. Yeah, there was. Yes. 
And I would like to talk about that if we're willing. Um, there's a few different parts of the project, the crossing at Long Hill, the Kinvern Street measures for, uh, for traffic calming and the NSLC um, connection that we're all predicated on this concept of a community-wide bike route. It's been underlaid now through the Blue Route planning process. It's been included in the transportation plan. Um, there's been a, a lot of reference to it, but ultimately there's never been any consultation um, specific to this, except that was carried out by Bicycle Nova Scotia in our community and we participated, but we weren't behind it. So uh, the recommendation here was it is the winter and we're still waiting on funding, but there is something which we can do, which is engagement and there is engagement needed around the bicycling. So that was the recommendation. Thank you, Penny, for not letting us miss it. Um, there may be questions we didn't even have any discussion about. I'll make the motion. <laughs> I'll, I'll move the council direct staff to produce a public engagement plan concerning the establishment of a community-wide all ages bicycle route in accordance with the town's public engagement policy. Councillor Burdick. I was just gonna second that. <laughs> okay. On the question, anyone have any comments? <coughs> I think I think, Mer I think Mer the 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 blue route presentation that happened let's say 18 months ago, I still think it was one of the, the one of the best documents the councils reviewed. Really terrific document, really showed, you know, a lot of the rationale behind this conversation. So it might be worthy of digging that report back out and circulating it to the entire new council. Uh, and it might also be worth our while to, as part of this engagement process, to ask the Bicycle Nova Scotia folks to come back again. I thought that was one of the most memorable reports that I recall receiving in the last mandate. And um, I really think it, it had a big impact on council. It, it was, it, that impact showed up in the, in the capital budget and, and we're starting to see some of that in the transportation budget. So uh, it might, I think it, under the theme of engagement, I think that might be worth our while. Okay. Sir Ben would love to hear from us again. Okay. Kirk? Just to, I will double check, but I'm pretty sure the Blue Root study is in the council orientation document. If it's not, I will certainly share it around, but um, I've got my screens too divided right now to find it in a reasonable time. So we'll just double you check. But I think copy you, have of, you have an electronic copy, obviously, of the document. Okay. <laughs> it was in our orientation stuff. Councillor Carver. It, yes, and in the um, uh, staff report, there was mentioned that uh, contact had been made with the NSLC, and I wonder if there's any information that you could give us about that. Um, I, I don't really have. Uh, there's two things. We had some initial contact at the ground level there, walked around quite a bit back when the Bicycle Nova Scotia project was going on, and Derek and myself and the people at the store there locally in Bicycle Nova Scotia, but uh, we've gone back through the head office to essentially say that, you know, it's our our anticipation is that this would be part of a community wide process. Would you be interested in that? I've only had the initial back saying, you know, this is something we'd be willing. But on our end, um, I do think it's really important that we have a sense of what the expectations would be. So with this motion going forward, then that I think that's really well timed for for bringing in stakeholders and like they're going to want to see because this is the only way to do this on NSLC property will include capital improvement. Like there's no question there. So whatever happens, they're not gonna want it to be them doing something that isn't part of an identified network <laughs> that the town hasn't made any commitments to. So I, I think that what we're gonna find is that that conversation will be very much this conversation. How do we develop the plan and make them a partner and make them proud to facilitate a plan that gets the kids a safe way to and from the school um, but yeah, and so right now it's very preliminary just to let them know that this is the direction that we're going. And then there were some great discussions with the site folks, but obviously they don't have the authority to commit the, the corporation. So will we have to deal with the issue of um, an alcohol uh, outlet kind of being a partner in a physical activity promoting for youth project? 
I mean, I, I do think that that's part of how the province of Nova Scotia attempts to do good by the public retailing of alcohol and gambling. I mean, they, they try to do community things. So, um, yeah, I, I think you, you kind of got to got to accept the one with the other. Um, Just raising the question. <laughs> um, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, I, I, oh, sorry, I think it, it, it can be done without uh, w without their money. So I, I would say that uh, uh, we should not mix alcohol with children getting active. So ex expect lots of pushback from uh, my colleagues and, and, and uh, you've met many of them. So that's a conversation that we, we will have when, when it comes to the table. Good to know that it's coming. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be an interesting discussion for the community if it means town taxpayers' money going into due property improvement for the Liquor Commission. Yeah. Did we vote? Not yet. Okay. We're still on the question. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Motion on the table. Council directs staff to produce a public engagement plan concerning the establishment of a community-wide all-ages bicycle route in accordance with the town's public engagement policy. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Motions carried. Thank you. Then, but now we're back to the solid waste hauling contract. Yet again. <laughs> we're still stuff. Take the garbage out. So the um, you know pra practical thing here is we went into the last contract hoping to save a little bit of money because we've had a great working relationship with GE, but they did propose that we would need this service. And most of the time when a company tells you you're going to need a service, then they're going to make sure you need the service. Um, so for one reason or another, I'm going to say we do feel that our service with GE is not um, where we'd hoped it would be. And they're right to point out that that has to do with the root supervisor function. And uh, we have a price here from GE to add that function. I think at this point, it's either um, that we agree to this or we will spend more staff effort attempting to make good on our decision to save this money. Um, so ultimately, uh, Mo might be able to comment. I believe the other communities all have opted for root supervisors at this point. So um, I, I will say, I think we were wrong to suggest we could get away without it. And we are now recommending that we do add a root supervisor to our contract, uh, whether at this time, because it is an ongoing issue, or to refer this forward to budget is certainly appropriate. We just won't have a solution in the meantime. Mayor, I'd move that council approve the addition of a root supervisor to the town of Mahone Bay's contract with GE at an annual cost of $3,714.87. Uh, plus a 2.25 percent annual increase. Thank you. Second. Seconded by Councillor Wilson. On the question. All in favor? Motions carried. Thank you. That is the end of the staff reports. Let's go to uh, items number item number seven. Uh, council items and 7.1 is the actual appointments of council members to the various committees. There have been three or four rounds of discussions, a little bit of horse trading back and forth, and we end up with the list of appointments that the clerk sent out yesterday, wasn't it, I think? So yeah, yesterday or the day before it came out. Yes, okay. So what I would propose is we would go down the list, committee by committee, name the person who has been, uh, who's in a position to accept the appointment for that committee and somebody makes a motion to appoint and then someone seconds it. And if we do it quickly, it won't take very long. Let's start with the Age-Friendly Community Committee. Uh, Councillor Carver is the chair, nominated for the chair, and Councillor Burdick as vice chair. 
Somebody move a motion. Councillor now moves. Do we have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Feeney, all in favor? Okay, let's go to the Asset Management Committee. Uh, Mayor Deveni is the chair. Deputy Mayor Kangata is the alternate. And Councillor now is the vice chair. So moved. Seconded by Councillor Carver. All in favor? Motion's carried. The Audit and Finance Committee Everyone on council is on that committee and, and the mayor is the chair and the deputy mayor is the vice chair. Do we, we need an appointment for that, for the chair and vice chair since we're all on it? Okay. Cemetery committee. The, um, I'm on the committee as a member. The deputy mayor is the vice chair. Councillor Feeney is the chair. Moved by Councillor Wilson, seconded by Councillor Now. All in favor? Oh, do you have a question, Deputy Mayor? Sorry, you, you mentioned me there, but I'm not in the cemetery committee. No. Well, I've got you here as the vice chair. Okay. Of the cemetery committee. Am I looking at the wrong one? This is Maureen. Uh, uh, Clerk, this is does your list agree? I'm just gonna see if I can find the one you sent in case there was a mistake. This is this, yep. this is this one. Yep. Okay. We were all too busy making the jokes about this one and we never got there. Uh, yeah, I'm just dying to get on it. Okay, <laughs> we have a we have a motion, it's seconder. All in favor? Motions carried. Let's go. Economic Development Committee is still up in the air, but the Heritage Advisory Committee is not. Uh, the chair of the committee, the nominee is Councillor Feeney. Uh, Councillor Burdick is the vice chair. Councillor Carver is the alternate. Can I have a motion? So move. Okay. Moved by Councillor Carver, seconded by Councillor Burdick. All in favor? Motions carried. The Planning Advisory Committee. The Deputy Mayor is the Vice Chair. Councillor now is the Chair. So moved. Seconder. Seconded by Councillor Wilson. All in favor? Motions carried. Let's go to the Police Advisory Board. Uh, I, the, the Mayor is the Chair. The Deputy Mayor is the Vice Chair. Uh, Councillor Wilson is the alternate. And um, I just point out that Councillor now is on the committee, but not as a councillor. He is a provincial government appointee. Councillor Hughes, or I'm sorry, not not yet anyway. Clerk <laughs> <laughs> Hughes, uh, could I ask if Council is willing? Would um, they be willing to appoint? Uh, our citizen Richard now as the provincial appointment at the same time while making this motion? We can include that in the same motion. The if councilor you're willing. now as Mr. Now is the provincial representative on the police advisory board. Can I have a motion? Yes. Councillor Feeney, a seconder? I'll second. Yeah. Councillor Carver, uh, all in favor? Good, motion's carried. And finally, the watershed advisory, the uh, nominee is Councillor Now. Could I have a motion? But if I might uh, say, uh, Mr. Mayor, I think that in past, <clears throat> if, if I'm following correctly back in around 2008, nine, that area, there were two members on that uh, committee. Uh, I don't know what team? happened in recent years, but. <clears throat> The list, I think, that the, the clerk has attached to the correspondence tonight does talk about two, but certainly in the last council, uh, Deputy Mayor Noss was the only participant on that watershed committee. 
I, I'd be interested if that on that one if 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 there are two needed. Well, there there should be two by by definition. So, Councillor Carver will take the other on the watershed advisory. No, I lost. The CAO it. has his hand up. Yeah, I've lost my screen now. Just wait one second here. Mm -hmm. I'm zoom in. There it is. Okay, I'm sorry. Who had their hand up? CAO. CAO. Yes, sir. Hi, yeah, I'm just uh, looking at the terms of reference because the committee's policy was in the package. Uh, it does say two members of council. So yeah, I don't know why that was off last time, uh, but we definitely can have a second member of council. Okay. And, and they only, I think they meet every like twice a year. So, so do yeah, we have a, a minimum of a motion for the watershed. Deputy Mayor, Councillor Now seconds. All in favor? Motions carried. Um, the area group we already appointed at the last meeting, MJSB, we appointed at the last uh, meeting. The Joint Accessibility Committee, the nominee is Councillor Carver with the Deputy Mayor as a, an alternate. Moved by Councillor Burdick, seconded by Councillor Wilson. All in favor? Done, thank you. The Joint Transportation uh, Committee, um, we have um, Councillor Burdick, and Councillor Wilson on that committee. Moved by Councillor Now. Second. Seconded by the Deputy Mayor. All in favor? Motion's carried. Let's go to the Lunenburg, well, no, Lunenburg County Senior Safety. We, uh, we Council appointed Councillor Carver again to that uh, at the last meeting. Mayor's deputy CAO, uh, there's no appointment there because it's the person in the position. The, the um, Riverport Electric Light Company, the same membership appointed to that as is appointed to area because of the cross purposes uh, of the businesses. So the RELC representation will be myself, um, and Councillor Feeney will be an alternate and Councillor um, Wilson. Okay, so can we get a motion? So moved. So move. Okay, moved by Councillor now, seconded by Councillor Wilson. All in favor? Motion's carried. Um, the Remo um, is, is the, let me see, it's uh, the mayor. And Councillor Carver is the <coughs> and Councillor now is the other member of Remo. Can we get a motion? So move. Seconder. Councillor Burdick, all in favor? Thank you. Um, Region six. We have Councillor now and Councillor Wilson for the regional six representation. Can I get a motion? Councillor Burdick, uh, seconded by Councillor Feeney. All if I might favor. interject there, Mr. Mayor, I think, there's only, I think there's only one member appointed, the other one's an alternate. Oh, so Councillor uh, Wilson will be the alternate, I believe was the yeah. intention. Okay, Councillor Wilson, you're okay with that? Yep. All right. Uh, sorry, Your Worship, that went a little fast for me. Once we started discussing uh, fine tuning, where was the motion and the second on that one, please? The the, the motion was. Uh, who made the motion? I meant, and who seconded it? Yeah, I think Councillor Wilson <laughs> seconded it. Councillor Now was the mover. Thank Pardon you. me. I think Councilor I moved. Now it. I think was the mover. Councillor Now was the mover. I believe. Now and Wilson. Thank you. Are, are they allowed to move a motion uh, for themselves? Because sure they are the two. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm the only one that's not allowed to make a motion. Uh -huh. Okay. All in favor? Motion's carried. Um, Social Housing Action Group. 
The nominee is Councillor Burdick with Councillor Carver as an alternate. So move. Move, seconded by Councillor Burdick. All in favor? Motion's carried. Um, the shared building inspection group. Nominee is Councillor Wilson. So move. Moved, seconder. Deputy Mayor, all in favor? Do we need an alternate on that one, Mr. Mayor? Okay. Do we need an alternate on that one? Um, wouldn't hurt. As an alternate, you're going to get the information from, from yeah. the committee structure. You'll be on their distribution list. But Deputy Mayor? I don't mind being an alternate on that one. OK. Councilor Now, are you comfortable with Deputy Mayor being the alternate? Yeah, I wasn't suggesting I be the alternate. I was just suggesting we needed one. OK. Uh, OK, so. Deputy Mayor Kangata will be the alternate on that one. All right, we've got a mo motion. We've been seconded, all in favor. Motion's carried. The swimming pool, Councillor Feeney. Ready. Can we get a, a, no, yes, Maureen. I, I have. I have a question about, um, we normally have a staff person that is appointed to that committee as well. Oh, Are I didn't we, think we would be, that's Derek, I think, isn't it? Yeah, we don't have to do edit. We don't have to appoint that, do we? It's just the person who occupies the position that Derek so. occupies is in that role. Yeah, yeah, it would be strange to have anyone else there. The guy who controls the water controls the pool. Thank okay. you. The motion is on Councillor Feeney swimming pool. Moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Carver. All in favor? Motion's carried. Uh, the Town's Caucus, it's an NSFM group, and we are all on that anyway. And then there's the Regional Library and the Western Region Housing Group, and there are two citizen appointments to that. I think one of them is supposed to keep going for a bit and the other one will be posted shortly. Okay, so those are our assignments for the next couple of years. Thank you very much. Oh. Anyone have a comment, Councillor Carver? Oh. And will there be no notice sent to all of the external organizations about the appointees? Yes. Nodding heads, thank you. I'm looking at the clerk to see what yeah, she's- Some have already gone and the rest will go tonight. Here you go. Okay. That's well, all we tomorrow. <laughs> Pardon me? Well, tomorrow. Tomorrow, not tonight. Yeah, okay. it's 9.30, I'm going to bed when we're done. I they might be watching this, hanging on her every word. Item 7.2, sponsored by Deputy Mayor Kangata. Uh, CMHC Razi, uh, Rapid Housing Initiative. Deputy Mayor, would you like to enlighten us? Yeah, um, I, I would have hoped to have had, uh, to, to have, uh, I guess, longer time for this, but I know that uh, uh, it's late. What I wanted to do is just bring to the council's, council's attention that the federal government, you probably know this already, the federal government has launched this initiative and there's funding there uh, to, to, for, for, for communities to explore affordable housing and figuring out how that can work. I think there might be some very good ideas in the community as to how we can tap into that funding and uh, sort of wondering whether this is something that council is interested in pursuing. I know affordable housing was one of the, I guess, at least during my campaign going around was one of the hot topics and people are really mm -hmm concerned about uh, the state of things. And so if there's funding available, uh, can we exploit that and, and think about how, how we can tap into that? Uh, it, it's come up in the social housing uh, coalition um, meeting conversations. And I think uh, there's, some, there's some movement, at least in the town of Bridgewater, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, my home base will not be left out. Just putting it out there for us to have a conversation about. Okay. Yeah. Councillor Burdick? Sorry. Uh, yeah, I 
really would like us to investigate that further. It's a really interesting initiative. Um, I took a little look at it and it looked like there's a specialist for the Atlantic area who maybe already has been communicated with, I don't know, uh, through the South Shore Housing and Action uh, group, but it looks like a it looks like it could be a really valuable initiative. Mm. Uh, Councillor Carver, would you know who the contact might be in Shack to? Well, I I sent this same information to um, uh, the CAO and to you, I believe, copied to you. A couple mm -hmm. of weeks a couple of weeks ago, my understanding is that um, th these two initiatives are very rapid turnaround. And as I said in my email to the CAO, I it doesn't look like we could get on on board with this one now, but that there are some good ideas. But mm. well, I've I've had the topic added to the agenda for the mayor's deputy CAOs. Uh, which is coming up in the first week of December. And it will be Chester, Lunenburg, Bridgewater, the county, and Mahone Bay. And I'm, I was hoping to have the discussion to see if there's a common yeah. interest that we might pursue. That might mean that we don't build anything in Mahone Bay and it yeah. all gets built in Lunenburg. I don't know. But, but yeah, we might exactly. have more clout as a county group yeah, so I've, had, I've had it added to the agenda at the mayor's deputy CAO. G great, and I, I um, yes, and I, I think that Mahone Bay will need will need some specific um, approaches, and I think that the regional application for this kind of thing might be more appropriate. But that's just off the top of my head. Mm. Okay, CAO. Yeah, like Councillor Carver said, she did bring this up and certainly it's come to my attention before and, you know, I have a lot of interest in this area, but this program is quite explicitly for existing concepts. So to, to be able to move something forward, we would have needed to position ourselves to have an existing concept to be working in the community on that. I think it's great uh, potentially to be able to throw our support behind another project, which could certainly serve residents here through transportation links and other things. There may be something in Lunenburg or Bridgewater. The Mayor's Wardens is a good mm -hmm. way to go about that. I was just going to suggest that the, the other option, you know, given the very finite time frame here, um, would be to initiate the conversation in our community by putting out a call and saying, are there any proposals for immediate housing action in Mahone Bay? from anyone else. Yeah. I mean, we don't have any. So uh, unless someone else does, then I think we're definitely out of luck for right now. And, and most likely we're out of luck for December 31st, but to get the conversation going means to hear those concepts. And yeah. um, in our community, we don't have a roster of underutilized buildings that we're just looking for opportunities to convert into housing. I, you know, a lot of rural Nova Scotian communities do. I think we're fortunate not to, but in this case, it means we don't have a ready answer. So mm -hmm. that's a suggestion I would have at least to see if anyone in the community, I, I think Deputy Mary even said, maybe there are some ideas out there. Mm -hmm. Councillor Burdick? Yeah, I think it's a really good idea to put it out there as a specific uh, note, maybe in the mayor's newsletter on social media, etc. Because I do know that there are architects and people who have lots of ideas about um, potential projects. It, I, I guess, yeah, the, the time turnaround could be difficult, but it did look like there were two different streams, streams there. Um, yeah. The second one might be our... That would be the, the one the money seems yeah. to be already allocated. It's yeah, it, that's yeah, that's the one. The, the project stream seemed to be the one that would be worth investigating. And they talk about a lot of different kinds of housing, not just you know the big box store sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Count, uh, De uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, the, the other piece that I probably just want to put out there is that. Uh, uh, my hope is that maybe there might there might be other opportunities that may come out, uh, and this can trigger us as a council to start thinking and initiating some things that we can take advantage of. Any anything that comes out. Uh, so so far we, as as a as, as a council, we don't have any kind of uh, uh, addressing homelessness and uh, affordable housing 
plan or uh, that's not something that we've actually gone out and done. Uh, what, what I'm hoping that this can trigger us to do is come up with something or think about how we can we can put something together, whether whether it's uh, a special meeting about that, whether it's, uh, I don't want to say committee because I know we have so many committees, but uh, if we can come up with an, uh, some ideas, even if it's from the community, so that whenever opportunities like this arise, we're able to capitalize on them. And yes, it's great that if we do it as a county, but uh, there probably would be advantages for us doing it in Mahombe because there they could be, when I look around, there are lots of buildings that maybe could be repurposed. There are lots of spaces that maybe could be thought about differently and things like that. So maybe mm -hmm. you need to put our, our heads together and uh, put some ideas on the table and get the community to give us ideas. Okay. So uh, are we going to give any direction to staff around this item or? Yeah, if we are going to put out a call for ideas and concepts, then we do need to be directed to do that by council. Okay. So can we have a motion to that effect, Deputy Mayor? Yes, uh, I, I put forward a motion for, for staff to put out a call to the community to, uh, to investigate if they have, if anybody in the community has ideas that could take advantage of the Rapid Housing Initiative Fund, and if not, plans for affordable housing in Mahome Bay that we can develop for future okay. funding opportunities. The seconder, Councillor Bird. It's moved and seconded. On the question. All in favor? Motions carried. Let's go to Councillor Carver's housing motion. Yes, more on, more on housing. Um, so I have brought uh, a motion to council and this was uh, based on a report that was given at the last meeting of the South Shore Housing Action Coalition um, by planners at, uh, from Modal. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'll read, I'll read the, uh, the full motion. So whereas the town of Mahone Bay is currently engaged in a process to develop a new municipal planning strategy, and whereas the Municipal Government Act requires that new municipal planning documents must be reasonably consistent with the provincial statement of interest on housing, and whereas the municipality of the district of Lunenburg has initiated an assessment of housing supply and demand, that will serve as a basis for policy recommendations for the pending review of the modal planning strategy. And whereas the statement of interest encourages the preparation of intermunicipal planning strategies where possible, therefore be it resolved that council direct staff to initiate discussion with the modal planning staff and to prepare a report for council about the possibility of intermunicipal collaboration between the town of Mahone Bay and Modal on the topic of housing in the preparation of their respective planning documents. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Burdick seconds. Questions? All in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you, Councillor Carver. And let's go to our committee reports. Uh, CAO, do you recall if there's any motions in these reports? No, I don't. I don't think there, there was. Um, unless. Oh, the Economic Development Committee has their action plan, of course. But um, we may want to. Uh, I guess I, I will say that because council is still considering the terms of reference for the committee, you may want to hold off on approving the action plan in light of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then the, the, the Heritage Advisory Committee, there's nothing spectacular in that. Um, Lunenburg County Senior Safety Program, but the Lunenburg County Physician Recruitment and Retention Working Group, I thought, Councillor Carver, you might want to speak to that one. Oh, I, I would have liked to have speak to spoken to the senior safety report. Is there anything significant in that report? There's always something significant well, in that report. No, and I, go ahead. 
You want to talk this about is, I, I just would like to say this is a new council with new people on the council, and yeah. I would I want it's important I think to um, speak to the go for the report. Thank you very much. Um, I want I want to say that the senior safety program is uh, an early example of a community group collaborating with the police to um, work with with citizens in a non-police kind of way. In fact, the, um, because they're based out of two different police programs, the RCMP and the Bridgewater Police Service, the senior safety coordinators um, provide um, a community response to people whose behavior and whose needs are very challenging. Um, so the, uh, Currently, there's an increasing complexity and intensity of the needs, um, including um, several deaths uh, involved in, in the, the, the program. The, uh, there's increasing challenges because of COVID. Um, there is uh, a, an increase in the number of scams. People have been losing thousands of dollars. Um, and the senior safety coordinators are uh, helping to work those things out. Um, and I want to get put, put a specific um, mention of the funding here for this program um, with $25,000 annually from the province department of seniors and a comparable amount from the five municipalities um, on a prorated basis by population. Uh, so that's uh, $50,000 so far, and then everything else is kind of patched, a patchwork of grants constantly. Um, so I just would like people to know, recognize the valuable service that it uh, provides. And in Mahone Bay, there ranges from around 10, 12, 13 people involved at any given time. So that's the Senior Safety Program. Thank if there you, are any questions, feel free, send me, a, send me an email. Okay, and the position recruitment and retention. Yes, I, um, I, I, I sent this report um, because I, I just wanted to really make the point that the, uh, the now Lunenburg County Physician Recruitment and Retention Working Group has been doing such an incredible job in supporting the, um, the work of the provincial uh, physician recruiters. Um, and it's an excellent working relationship now. And whereas we had uh, um, initially as a town um, focused on Mahone Bay and actually assigned two of councillors, uh, Councillor Feeney and myself, um, to work with the, this group, it really has grown into a countywide effort now. And I just want to tell you that um, in 2019, five family physicians were brought to the county, one in Hubbards, one in Chester, one in Mahone Bay, one in Bridgewater, and one in Lunenburg. And coming next year in 2021, um, they've got five more family physicians on deck as well as four specialists coming in 2021. So that's important information. Um, the, I, I, I just want to, that Mahone Bay Town Council to keep in mind that this work is important economic development work um, because even doctors are asked at the beginning, is there any transportation it's, can, can my patients get to my office? Um, or they won't come if certain things aren't available to them. And the physicians uh, and people won't move to the area if they don't have physicians available. So it's important economic development work. Um, so I'm putting out that pitch uh, when it comes to budget time. And my recommendation is, does count if about council wanting to continue having a member appointed to the group? I don't think it's necessary. Um, I think that it's been value added for, for uh, members of council to contribute to that group. Um, but I don't think it's necessary to make another appointment. 
Okay, thank you. Councillor Feeney, would you support that? No, it's fair. I, I think it's a similar analogy to, you know, the Coastal Action Group that, you know, has matured and expanded its overall mandate. And then it was no longer, you know, really seeking having, it was obviously seeking council support and seeking, you know, support from community members who may also be councillors. Um, but as far as specifically requiring the appointed, uh, an appointed councillor, I think, you know, that I, I agree with councillor Carver that, that that is no longer required. But, um, you know, I, I echo her, uh, her sentiment about the, you know, the real value of Lunenburg now. I mean, that organization has done incredible work. Uh, and I think it'll continue to do incredible work. And there'll be opportunities for, for the council and for through funding appropriations through the appropriate processes, you know, to, to, you know, to show the support. I think, I think we've really received a lot of benefit from that, from that organization over the last five years. I, I honestly never thought we were going to get these doctors. Uh, you know, I've sat on various, as Councilor Carver, I've sat on various physician recruitment committees for over a decade, and they were really failures until the most recent incarnation, largely driven by the Lunenburg Now team and some dynamic individuals who we all are well aware of. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's been a terrific success story. Okay, well, thank you. And, and Councillor Carver and Councillor Feeney, thank you for your commitment to that group for a long period of time, kept Mahone Bay's uh, hand in the mix. And, you know, with five and five and four, uh, the process works. There is some proof to it. Mm. Okay, um, that is the end of our committee reports, and that is the end of our agenda. Never mind what time it is. We will, uh, it, we will now entertain a motion to adjourn. And once we have done that, uh, are there any people online? Kelly? We have some questions. There are people watching, but we have no questions this evening. Okay. Well, on that note, thank you very much, Council. Entertain a motion to adjourn. I thought nobody was going to do that. <laughs> Councillor now has moved. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Burdick. Uh, 